Innovation Commission. Um, as the first mayor of business, we need to waive the rules to um, allow members to participate, members and the public to participate electronically or by telephone. Um, we do have a quorum of six of the seven commissioners. Um, so would someone, would a commissioner like to make a motion to allow um, a Zoom meeting? I'll do it. Um, I move that we suspend the um, normal vote in-person voting and um, adopt um, the voting through Zoom. Uh, second. I'll second. Okay. Um, roll call vote, uh, Commissioner Idle. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Yes. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. And Commissioner Simon is an aye. Um, for the um, applicants and members of the public who are um, on the, the um, Zoom call, um, our procedure will be, we'll go through each item one by one. Um, the applicant will have an opportunity to present their materials um, and um, give you know, reasons why their um, request should be approved. Um, we'll then have questions from the commissioners. We'll have a brief time for members of the public to speak um, or alternatively, Kate can read in um, comments received by um, members of the public, at least refer to them. Um, we'd ask that all members of the public keep their um, comments down to a maximum of two minutes as we've got a really long meeting. Um, we'll then have any final commission discussion and uh, a vote on each matter. Um, so the first matter was uh, 2404 Ridge Avenue. Um, I, I saw Mr. Um, right on the call, but I think the plan was to continue, the request was to continue the hearing until February 9th. Um, that's my understanding. Is there any discussion or clarification of that? I do have, I have a quick note, Chair. Um, I did talk to the community development director and the city does recommend that commissioners hear the case at this evening's meeting, um, particularly because a second continuance would require the case to be re-noticed. It's an opinion of the director that this attempt as well as numerous previous continuances has disenfranchised neighboring property owners um, who attend these meetings in good faith, that they will be heard and action taken. Um, I, I also just personally think that you do have enough information um, provided to make a decision, but it's it's certainly up to you. Okay. Um, I mean, we this actual application, I think we continued once. Um, obviously the application that it arose out of um, for the certificate of appropriateness was heard before. Um, are the, um, I know there were a number of members of the public who um, had indicated to you that they might, that they had comments, are they in attendance or were they given, did you think they know that we were hearing this tonight? The, the, the agenda said there would be continued, that's why I'm asking. I think there's there was some confusion amongst property owners. Um, I was copied on quite a few emails between them and the development director. I did receive two written comments um, that if, if no one else is here to, to give public comment, I would read into the record. Um, all right, well, I thought I saw Mr. Schweitzer on the call and not seeing, um, oh, I see Chris, it says Chris Schweitzer, are you on the call? I am on the call, Rick Schweitzer, yep. Um, would you be prepared to present the matter? N no. Um, could we ask Mr. Schweitzer what additional information he hopes to have by February 9th that would change his presentation? What's the, what's the need for a continuance? Well, <clears throat> I, I'm happy to address it. I, I note that in many cases, an additional continuance is requested for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> um, amongst them, there have been, uh, there's been a substantial change in the makeup of the commissioners recently uh, and there's um, 
an election around the corner. And the, with due respect, um, preferring to wait until there's some new perspectives to consider this might be important to us. It might bring a brighter, fairer, more dispassionate look to it. We're awaiting freedom of information evidence that might help us. We would be very interested in hosting a very brief walkabout, as I mentioned to Mr. Sterling, for the commissioners outside at a convenient time to fully understand what it is exactly what we're talking about, because given the actually the bad information, incorrect information that has existed over la uh, recent meetings, a brief walkabout would tell, put the tell the lie and put the truth on exactly what it is. And that would be just up to you to, to see it. And then lastly, we'd rather wait until the new year to um, for a brighter, less stressful look at, at this during a, what's a very, um, during what's a very dour and difficult time. Um, I mean, this is the, I mean, this was continued once. Um, I mean, I'd be in favor of continuing it for one more month and hearing until everybody is kind of, particularly since the agenda said it would be continued, so everybody knows it's going to be heard um, and um, just hear it next month. That, that would be my preference. I, I don't know what you guys, fellow commissioners, feel. One clarification, it's actually two months, if I understand the agenda, it's, the request was to move it to February 9th meeting. Well, if we feel that it's not moving expeditiously, and, you know, truthfully, we frequently will continue matters for, you know, two times, but that's all. And uh, I mean, if we feel there's no reason to wait two months and want to just do it one month, we can do that too. That, that would be my preference. <laughs> Do other, how do other commissioners feel? And I don't know how you feel about continuing a month or. And I mean, I I had I had walked by this site some time ago, so I'm familiar with the property from from one of the previous applications. Um, I don't know if anyone else feels the need to visit the site again and become more firsthand familiar, and if continuing it for another month gives other commissioners the opportunity to do that. I mean, the, the application for certificate of appropriateness was already um, heard and turned down. Um, th this is an application just for certificate of hardship, um, which is you know, kind of just one, I mean, you know, again, we have, if we were gonna talk about it, we'd have to go back. I mean, we'll have to go back. When we talk about it, we'll have to go through the ordinance and discuss what the standards are for that, but they're much more limited than a review of the um, certificate of the, the application itself. They don't really go back to the merits of the case. To, to that point, if I may say that, um, again, a brief walkabout would, would, would address the standards and the merits of the case and some of the disinformation that I fear has transpired even in the written record. And it would be a little different than walking around the property as Commissioner Idle had, has, has done and perhaps others have done. And it, it really wouldn't take long to understand it very quickly and then be able to make a, a more dispassionate decision that would be, um, that we would like to see. All right, let's, just, let's just deal with the, um, whether we should continue it or not. Um, do other commissioners have an opinion? I just wanted him to explain how uh, viewing the property would clarify the issues surrounding the application for hardship. Because it would become um, very transparent and evident the amount of energy, passion, monies that we have put into preserving and restoring for an adaptive reuse 
this very historical property that was derelict over Thank 20 you. years. And the view would help you understand what it would mean to undo that. And again, it wouldn't take long. Um, and then you'd be able to make your own mind up with full clarity. Okay. I mean, I think it, it's hard to deal with the merits of the case without dealing with the merits of the case. So I think we should, we've got a, a huge agenda tonight. We should just decide whether they're willing to extend and for how long. And, and it's just the commissioners to um, voice what they'd like to do. I support a one month extension. I agree. Okay. I agree. All right. Um, Jamie, do you want to make a motion for that? Um, I move that we um, extend so that we are hearing the case for 2404 Ridge Avenue, um, a landmark 20 Prez 0308, uh, a certificate of economic hardship until the December. January 12th. January 12th meeting. A second? Second. Susie, second. Um, uh, um, roll call vote, Commissioner Idle. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, I think we will want to hear the matter at that meeting um, and we'll at, at that time go into what the ordinance standards are for this particular application. Um, all right, the next uh, matter is 1735 Asbury, um, which was continued and the applicant is asking for a second continuance. Um, I'll, make a, I'll make a motion, Mark, if you want. Thank you. I move to continue 1735 Asbury Avenue to the January 12th meeting. Uh, second. I'll second. Second. Okay, Commissioner Morris. Um, roll call vote, Commissioner Idle. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. I'm an aye. All right. Um, the next matter was um, 1509 Forest Avenue. Is the applicant present? Hmm. No. Kay, do you know who was presenting this one? Um, I'm not positive who was presenting this one. I don't believe that it was. Um, the name in the in the agenda, Sergio. But they were. Everyone was contacted. Yeah. Why don't we maybe come back to it? my recollection? Was it was the contractor came and um, it was um, really was just coming back for some more detail. Um, all right. So let's maybe just come back to that one rather than continue it. Um, the next matter was 1534 Wilder Street, which was a um, matter we'd heard and uh, asked the, the applicant to come back with a different plan, which I think has happened. Is the applicant here? Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Prakash here. St. Mary's uh, Church Building Committee member uh, for 1534 Wilder Street. Uh, so we were able, we were looking at Anderson window. Um, they have Fibrex windows. Um, and I had a quote, uh, is it possible we can pull it up on the... Yes, I'm sorry, could we, um, whoever's controlling the screen share go to the this application? I think it's up a little bit, Melissa, Melissa Parker. Um, right there, number four, 1534 Wilder. Oh, 
I have the quote like on the I think the tenth page. Yeah, a little bit more down. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, it's coming up. Yes. Sorry, I'm not sure why it's acting that way. I'm trying to zoom in. You have to move the. There it goes. Yeah, there you go. That's they have the pricing there. So um, yeah, I think it came up to like uh, a little more up a little bit. Maybe you have some pictures there. Um, yeah. So we'll yeah, it's that's yeah, a little more up. A little bit more. One more. Oh, there you go. Yeah, just a tiny bit more up. Oh, okay. So that right there, right, right is good, good, good. So the windows, um, same windows, um, these are fiber racks, they're, they're not vinyl. So this is from Anderson windows and they came up to be $70,000, but after all the discounts, uh, they were able to bring it down to $49,000. Um, so, but uh, you know, it's still too much for us. And, um, and while I was doing that, I asked, uh, for the warranty of these windows, the windows are, uh, Anderson windows are warranted for 20 years. So um, also the vinyl windows that we trying to put, um, they have the same warranty. Uh, they're 20 years warranty. Um, and, uh, and they're basically high quality uh, vinyl windows. They use uh, three and a quarter thickness frame uh, virgin lead free vinyl, uh, fusion welded four point with the four point welder, uh, same pressure. So they built to last. Um, so, and also they said they use a multi chamber profile uh, to make it extra strength insulated, you know. So yeah. these windows that we're trying to get um, has 20 year warranty. The vinyl windows um, that's on the bottom, I'll go down a little bit. I'm sorry. It has the warranty paper on them. I didn't have it last time, you know. A little bit more down. It has like, oh, yeah, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go, a little bit more, yeah. Th this is the window company right there, right there, right there. Uh, the, that's their certificate saying it is warranted for 20 years. Um, so the company name is Advanced Window Corporation. They've been in Chicago for 20 years. They're wholesalers. And um, so the warranty was equal to Anderson Windows, you know? And uh, we are getting the 6300 series. Uh, I think I have some brochures and look some pictures, uh, go down a little bit more. Yeah, these are the drawings. Um, I think, I'm sorry, uh, it's actually about the, right about the certificate. You know, I had the pictures. Yeah, th those, those windows right there, you know, they're uh, yeah, super quality um, 
vinyl windows, you know, go up a little bit more, has a little bit more pictures of the poster. Yeah, so we would really like it if the if you guys give us the permission to put this vinyl windows um, because uh, this is like the top of the line uh, quality uh, twenty year warranty of windows that we we can afford and we're able to will be able because the windows right now it's all stuck and some of them are broke the glass is broke. Yeah, the, especially with the hail damage in April that caused most of the damage, you know. So we really need this done before the winter gets bad, you know. So you're not applying to um, use the renewal by Anderson windows? So, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, we would like to put, because uh, Anderson windows uh, and this, ad, we want to put the advanced window corporation uh, vinyl windows, uh, because uh, they, they were able to give us a, a, a better deal and it's affordable and plus it has the 20 year warranty on it. It's, you know, because they're built good and, you know, superior quality, they're able to give us a 20 year warranty on it, you know, same as the, the Anderson window. So we, we would really appreciate if you could put the advanced window corporation um, a vinyl window on the property. Um, can you remind us um, whether it's feasible, I mean, to, to do uh, repair of some of the existing windows until you've raised enough money to put in the, um, you know, it, it will approve it, the five rex windows? Yeah, the problem is like, you know, like most of the windows there are like broken and um, like they are stuck, like, you know, they're, you, some of them you can't even open. All of them are like that, you know, they're really old windows, you know. Um, Do you want to just show us the pictures of the- it, yeah, you, it, yeah, you did have it on the top, like in the initial pictures, you know, in the last meeting, but it's, it's already on top, you know, you can see it. Can like, someone clarify for me whether this is a landmark building or simply a contributing structure? Um, the um, it, it was an odd one. It, you know, it would it, it would help if um, Michelle could scroll up to show the the building, please. Yeah, it has a drawing. Like um, it'll say it, it's basically sitting in the same lot. Yeah, that's a good good depiction right there. Stuart on the left, the um, the church is landmarked, and. Um, this is a, um, I can't remember, we figured out what the original use was. It's about, it's, it's a, just sitting in the same lot. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's like a 1913 building. I mean, it's not, you know, it's a landmark property. I mean, this isn't like excluded from it, but in the landmark write up, um, it might've mentioned this building, but it wasn't the primary reason. So it's, it's kind of a confusing set of facts. Um, Can we see okay. pictures of the building again? Yeah. The pictures it, are on, uh, Little bit I'm sorry. I would I would say that the building does have significant integrity, though. It it does have good integrity. I think we might have thought the building was built like, if I'm remembering correctly, like in 1913, perhaps. I think it's like uh, I'm not sure, but it's on the buildings, it's like 1929 or something. Okay. Uh, just for clarification, the existing windows are the original wood windows, correct? Yeah, um, on the third floor, on, I'm mean, sorry, on the second floor, uh, like uh, four or five windows are vinyl, but rest of them are, all of them, all the rest of them are, are original windows. And we were trying to put the wood, wood windows, but they were like almost, you know, it was all, everything was uh, expensive, you know, yeah. but um since it wasn't landmark, and I mean, I, like you said, like you know, it's in the sitting in the same as lot as a landmark. 
um, and plus the priest that uh, priest live there uh, right now. You know he, you know because it's too cold and we want to you know just to make it comfortable. We want to change all the windows. That's um, that's why we wanted to do this right away. You know to get really like get cold in there because of the, all the windows are it's not sealed and it, it just don't work anymore. You know. Can I ask you a uh, question? In the yes. materials you uh, provided for the vinyl windows, there's yes. a reference to something called a full divided light with spacer. Okay. Is that what is called a simulated divided light or is it a snap-in mutton? Sim simulated, simulated uh, divider lights. So It'll there is like a mutton applied to both sides of the glass? Um, they said like the uh, only way they could put it is it'll be in between the glasses, in between it's the glasses. It's a snap in, thank you. Yeah. Um, so it'll be like sandwiched in, you know, like between the glasses. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, we, we've generally been reluctant even to approve the um, renewal by, win by Anderson windows. I mean, you did get you know, kind of an amazing deal they're giving you on those, but I appreciate you don't have the funds. How do commissioners feel about, about this? Uh, can you tell me how many of the uh, current windows are vinyl replacement windows at the moment? Um, there are a total of uh, uh, 31 and um, we need to change 27 of them. 27, they're like damaged. I mean, basically. But some of, them, some of them are existing wood and some of them have already been replaced. Right. And you're right. telling us that the ones that are replaced are replaced with vinyl. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, we didn't do that. Uh, we, we got this building 25 years ago uh, from Archidice to Chicago. At that time, that vinyl window was there. We never changed anything. This is the first time uh, we... This is the first time we are trying to change it because of the hail damage, mainly because it broke the glass. You know, hit it, it hit us hard. That's otherwise we wouldn't come here because you know the you know the hail caused most of the damages on the window. You know, that that's what kind of made an emergency because this happened in April, and uh, that's that's the only reason we are right here uh, trying to change it because of the hail damage, basically. You know. I'm sorry, didn't you say just a few of the windows are vinyl, the current windows, like four or five, you said? Yeah, five on the second floor. Okay, so most of them are wood, is that answer? Yeah. We were kind of put in a position to change it because of the hail damage and plus because of the COVID situation. Before, you know, we used to have a lot of people coming in and to the church, you know, now, well, you know, usually like 200, 250 people. Now we get like 15 people, you know, so the revenue has came down a lot, you know, so we mm -hmm. kind of in a situation where the windows are damaged and uh, we, we have to change them because they're damaged. You know, I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Window replacement is always a difficult issue. Uh, the reason it's a difficult issue is that uh, contemporary windows uh, are installed in a different, slightly different plane from the old uh, wood windows, whether they're casement or double hung. So they're never going to look like the original windows. Uh, vinyl windows are a problem, at least visually, and which is what we're being asked to weigh in on uh, because of the material, the thickness of the sash is greater than an old wood window. Uh, if you have divided light windows, the question of snap-in or between the glass muttons comes up because they never look right. Uh, and the problem for me is weighing all of that against the fact that you have broken windows and should be allowed to uh, replace or repair them. Does insurance cover any of the, the breakage or not? Yeah, and since they're old, they, they gave us little money just to put glass on it, you know, that's all, you know, mm -hmm. so because, you know, they, they're uh, really old, they, they don't cover it, you know, they said it's, it's not there. I understand, you know, it's not. So you could, so I guess one alternative is to replace the glass, 
but in the long run, sold to replace the windows. Yeah, the um, yes, yeah. to to just to repair them for now. But only thing, um, most of them are like you know they're stuck, and you you know some of them the the too much air coming in through there, and you know priests that live there, you know, is is not comfortable. You know, he's like I, you know, he's usually by himself over there, and uh, he 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 really appreciated if you guys uh, gave us a chance to do this here. Well, um, let, let the commissioners talk about it. I don't know what you know, other commissioners feel that they want to do. It's a hard, hard decision. We understand the hardship, but we still have to make a decision. Um, my one concern is still just, um, just to understand, make sure I'm on the same page as the other commissioners. Um, so this is a, there's two buildings on the site. And there's a landmark and then that's the church and then there's the rectory which is this building and the church is not its own district it's its own landmark right. and we're being asked to consider actions that are being proposed for this other building that's neither landmark nor in a district defined as a district and so i guess i'm just um was there more I definitely understand how close it is, um, its architectural merits and whatnot, and its proximity to the landmark. But I guess by definition, I'm having um, a challenge making sure that we have jurisdiction over this building. So um, was, can you guys just clarify? I, I think the best way to, to look at it is if the, it, it's similar to if there was an accessory structure on a landmark property, okay. but the accessory structure itself was had significant integrity. Do you know, was the rectory, was it listed in the landmark designation? I just don't recall. I, I think I might've referenced it. It's the, the property as a whole is a landmark property. So th this is a landmark and we do have jurisdiction. I think, as Kate said, this is this is very similar to, I mean, it's it's, it's equivalent to a landmark property with a, say, a large coach house or something. That's what I was kind of thinking yeah. too in the back of my mind. Okay. So it's definitely a landmark property. We definitely have jurisdiction. Okay. Okay. But obviously, you know, obviously we do weigh the the accessory structures in in a different way, but we still have approval. Okay. Um, I just, from my point of view, I think it's difficult to allow the removal of original wood windows, primarily original wood windows, even though it is considered an accessory structure to on a landmark property, it's still difficult to allow the wood windows to be removed and then vinyl windows with not even simulated divided lights be installed. It's it's just, it's a very, it's switching to the other extreme significantly. Um, I think at the last meeting we requested, there were a couple things we asked about was whether phasing would be possible. Mark, you obviously asked this, this evening if repairs would be possible to extend the timeline so that then they can budget the work better. Um, we also ask for other options for materials because I think if we were getting closer to the wood windows, I think that would make it easier. But in my opinion, switching from original wood windows to these vinyl windows is, is almost too far. I, I completely understand the economic hardship in the sense that it, it's, it's been a hard year and, and these windows are damaged. It just seems like it's a too far of a stretch in, in my mind. Um, do other commissioners agree? I, I guess I would um, ask the applicants to really take a hard look at the phasing idea. Um, there's, you're looking at 30 windows in the building. I doubt that all 30 of them are that bad or that critical to the spaces that are really used or that got damaged by the hailstorm. So I'd, 
I'd rather see better quality, better looking windows installed in 10 or five openings rather than 30 vinyl windows and mm. just stretch it out over a longer period of time. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, is there anyone who, I mean, before we, well, first of all, let me ask if there's any member of the public that was here to speak about this matter. No, okay. Um, is there anyone who disagrees? No. Um, okay, Kate, I don't know if we need, a, I don't know if there's any support for a motion in favor, but I, I don't know if we need to bring a, um, a motion in favor and vote it down or we bring a, a motion to, to disapprove and urge them to consider other alternatives. I'm not sure what procedurally we should do. I think it depends. I mean, you could make a motion to approve with the five bricks if you think that's appropriate. Um, you could make a motion to deny the application or you could give them an opportunity to come back. So really the options, I think. Um, if the applicant wants to repair wood windows, they don't need a, an approval. Correct. Um, I mean, the Fibrex has its own issues and since it's not before the commission, I don't think we should discuss it. I mean, I suppose we could make a motion and vote on the vinyl windows, which is what the applicant has proposed. And then if they wish to resubmit a different concept later on, that's, that's up to them. Okay, that sounds great. All right, um, so you're suggest Kate, you're suggesting we make a motion in favor and then just vote on that. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. You can make a motion in favor of the application with the vinyl windows. Okay, Ken, do you want to present that? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll make a motion that we issue a certificate of appropriateness for the building at 1534 Wilder Street for replacement of all existing double hung wood windows with new double hung vinyl windows with uh, grills between the glass. Uh, standards for alteration one through 10 would apply. Okay, um, roll call vote, Commissioner Idol. Or we need someone to second, I guess. I'm sorry, <laughs> second. Second. Second, Commissioner Idol. All right, <laughs> getting ahead, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Idol. No. Commissioner Cohen. I'm going to abstain. I feel like it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the problem of cutting the child in half. Okay, Commissioner Morris. No. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. No. Uh, Commissioner Bodin. No. Commissioner Reinhold. No. And I'm a no. Um, okay, and, and it, you know, again, we've indicated there might be other plans that would work if the applicant wishes to return. Um, all right. Um, the next matter uh, was 1206 Hinman, which uh, was a hard one and that the applicant understandably needs more time and wants to continue until January 12th. Um, would someone like to make a motion to continue that one? I move to continue 1206 Hinman Avenue to the January 12th meeting. Uh, second. I'll second. Okay, Commissioner Idle. Um, roll call vote. Commissioner Idle? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Morris? Jamie, we can't hear you if you. Aye. Um, Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, the next matter was 929 Sherman Avenue. Thank you, Chair Simon and Commissioners and Kate. Uh, my name is Dick Coe. I'm 
are presenting um, the homeowners Doug and Fadia Nichols of 929 Sherman. And our application is to construct a new accessory dwelling unit to be attached to the existing garage. Um, I will now turn this over to Ralph Hoffman on our um, architecture team to make the presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for this opportunity. So um, the plan here is to build a, an accessory dwelling unit adjacent to, connected to the existing garage uh, in the rear yard of, of the property at 929 uh, Sherman. The, the new structure will use all the same materials and um, have the same sort of window configurations and proportions as uh, the front house and the, the garage. The garage is actually new. It was built, uh, it came before the board or the commission, I should say, back in 2017 and had been approved. Uh, so the garage is a relatively new structure. And because we're attaching to it, um, we're gonna use all the same cladding material, um, sizes of the material, the trim boards, the fascia details, the gutters, all of that will match um, the roofing uh, finish will match uh, the existing garage, which in turn uh, is a reflection of the primary structure at the front of the house. Um, the, you know, the color will also match as well. So if you go to the, I guess the, the last page in our presentation has, has a rent, uh, that photograph oh, down a little bit. Um, so the primary house is this sort of light gray with white trim uh, and windows. And then we've sort of tucked in behind uh, in the rear yard, you can see sort of peeking through the bushes there uh, where this new structure would be uh, in, the, in the rear yard. And if you go up to the site plan, which is uh, a couple of sheets up, you can then kind of see the orientation of where our proposed ADU is uh, sort of running along the north property line uh, north of the garage um, adjacent to it. Any questions? Could you show the, um, I think you, you had renderings of some type of the new structure. Yes, yeah, so these are sketches, um, they don't, necessarily show the materials in detail, um, but you can see the proportions of the, the new ADU as it's connected. It's a two-story structure connected to the garage and then to the left are the photographs of the existing. Um, and so the existing primary building has this sort of, uh, sort of random uh, windows and window sizes and, and placements. And we sort of picked up on that a little bit and intentionally uh, included that uh, on our um, on our structure as well. The smaller, you know, windows gang together and the larger windows. Um, you'll note on, um, maybe on the elevation drawing is actually better. So scroll down uh, one sheet. Um, there's a detail where there, there's a pair of windows um, that aren't fully sort of mulled together, but there's a little bit of siding in between them. That's that little uh, double window detail photo is off the front house. And we're picking up and repeating that sort of relationship in detail uh, on the double window or the windows that were sort of ganging together as it were on the, um, and the ADU as well, just sort of bringing that detail uh, to the back. And then on this sheet, you can also see, uh, these are shots off the, the garage with the cement board siding and the trim and the size and proportions of all of those uh, elements. And we're just repeating all of that uh, on the AD, ADU as well. Um, the entry doors are clad doors, just like they are on the on the garage uh, entry as well. And this um, this is uh, permitted because of the change of the zoning ordinance to allow ADUs. Did, did that? That is correct. 
That is correct. Um, we're doing a number of, of these uh, around Evanston right now. Um, I, I think there was a member of the public that had signed up to speak, perhaps. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this? Yes, we are the neighbors on the north side. And if you scroll, I think, up a little bit or down, I don't know. Uh, what you cannot see here in the photos is the, here you can see it on the left, um, in the left corner below, the, uh, the, the reddish building that is our building to the north. And uh, as you can see, the new building, the new added addition to the garage that was already added is squeezed in between um, uh, the 929 lot and our lot, which is 931. We have a special situation because on our lot, our home is a home, it is not a coach house. And uh, there's the building, our home is not a landmark building, but it is still um, a century old building. And our concern is that the addition to the addition will actually change the whole perception and uh, impression of the, the lot considerably. Apart from that, I, I uh, should not hide the fact that, uh, of course, squeezing in an additional ADU between the garage and our building um, that takes up almost the whole north, the whole side length of our building because it will be higher than the garage is um, certainly not in our interest. But we also think that this is really changing the whole impression of the building. I would like to hand it over to my husband, Martin Reinke, to, to speak a little bit more about the history of our building. I'm sorry, could you first um, state your name for the record? My name is Hille Haka. Okay, thank you. Yeah, then I think I'm taking over. Um, my name is Martin Reinke, also living in 931 Sherman Avenue. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention is we, we only heard from that plans uh, last Friday, so we are a bit uh, overwhelmed uh, uh, and we didn't see much of the plans yet, so we can only guess part of that, what, what is going to happen. But as far as we know um, that the new building will probably be about three or four feet from our building and uh, almost covering the south side. Uh, then a bit more about our building. Um, this was built 1910 as a warehouse. Uh, I was told it was a warehouse for olive oil. Uh, later on, I think it was also a recording studio. That's what people told me in the fifties probably. And in the seventies, it was remodeled and, and converted into a, into a regular, what's it, a regular uh, building to live in. So, so yeah, we, we are living in there since seven years and yeah. Okay, thank you. So what we would like you to do perhaps is um, because we didn't have time to either look at the uh, plans or so we were only informed by it by the postcard that we got from the city of Evanston and as you can see the windows for example the, the way they are placed they are just looking into our bedrooms <laughs> on the first floor and so on we would like you to actually take a look yourselves whether that is a good fit into the into the lot our building is not a landmark building but nevertheless of course it has a lot of history of Evanston and so on um, and uh, or yeah, maybe give us a little bit more time to uh, comment in January. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Uh, may I make, uh, uh, this is Ralph Hoffman again. Um, we did do uh, a study of the elevation of your building and took into consideration, we actually measured that facade and took into consideration um, the location of the windows on your building and strategically placed. Um, we don't have that many windows on the north elevation intentionally, and uh, we strategically located them uh, to take into account sight lines and to avoid, uh, yeah, you know, two windows being directly across from each other given the proximity to the site, uh, to the property lines. 
Could we perhaps go back to the site plan just to get a better mm -hmm. there? It doesn't depict the um, other home though. Yeah, we don't have that. Yeah, we don't have the other building. Um, there, if, in effect, would be about six feet. Uh, we're a little more than three feet off of the property line, and then, uh, you know, there's a three foot setback on their side as well. I don't. I don't think. If sure I may just weigh in, uh, because our property line, and that was probably a century ago, 1910, or when uh, I think mm -hmm. 1910 was the building built. Our one. I think our building is on the property line, so mm -hmm. there's no more three feet away from the property line on our side at all, and that, um, it, it, in a way, creates the problem to go three, four feet. Uh, into mm -hmm. the property line because it's really then only the three feet and and the one bedroom on our side only has the one window so that would be pitch dark in a way yeah okay thank you so you have an existing non-conforming use which isn't shown on the site plan right we do or the neighbor does the neighbor does yeah. the neighbor does yeah the neighbor, yes, yeah, we did not, um, we did not show their, their uh, structure on this site plan. And this is Dick Coe. I have the plot of survey that does show the neighboring um, improvements. I could share my screen if the commissioners would like to see the, the most recent uh, plot of survey. Yeah, it would be nice to know whether the distance between the buildings are th is only three feet or whether it's more. Sure, so let me share my screen here. And with the host has to permit that. Okay. He, he should be able to, oh, there we go. Okay. And you see the? Yep, yep. it is uh, <laughs> right on the lot line. A little yeah. over the lot. Uh, or even a few yeah, inches so over it's, at the it's one corner. Over yeah. it. <laughs> so you'll have less than three feet between the two structures. So mm. can, can, can I say something about this? Uh, because I don't know where, uh, as people who are weighing in about, uh, about the addition with respect to a certificate of appropriateness, it seems to me that it meets all of the standards. However, the structure uh, would be only three feet away from the existing building there. And while the garage, that addition uh, conforms to the zoning ordinance, I wonder, Mr. Hoffman, whether it meets all of the provisions of the building code with respect to any minimum distance requirements between adjacent buildings based on their size, their height, and their fire rated construction types? Um, to my knowledge, uh, yes, we've gone through zoning and zoning has approved this, uh, the building. No, zoning, uh, it's okay. I'm asking no, I understand. about the yeah. UBC. Yeah, yeah. So the um, building uh, to the north is, is an all brick masonry building and uh, using cement board, uh, you know, we would, we would maintain uh, the proper fire rating on our exterior, that north wall um, per the code. We haven't completed, uh, we haven't gone through the rest of um, the permit process, but yes. Yeah, you, you are to my understand. Yeah, to my understanding is, yeah, we would, we are, we can build. Uh, You're correct, Hoffman. Yeah. Typically they just make you fire rate that wall that's closest to the adjoining structure. That's right. Hmm. Excuse me. Can you tell me how the heights of the um, neighbor's structure compares to the height of your proposed new structure? Um, I don't have the exact height of the adjacent structure and it's steps um, from, I believe it's, it's uh, higher in the back and then steps down towards uh, Sherman. Um, our structure uh, would, the ridge of our structure um, shouldn't exceed, if you scroll down, I think on the, the, um, the elevations, do I have a, did I show a, yeah. Oops. Yeah, you'll have to zoom in. I 
I can't read it on my screen, but our um, the ridge uh, is 23, you know, in change, shy of 24 four feet in total height, which I believe is at or very near the height of the parapet of the adjacent um, building. But uh, you know, clearly, it's a gabled roof, so that sets back from from the property line. So our 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 gutter or the eave at that north side would be you know nine foot plus another you know plus or you know eighteen feet and change, nineteen feet and change. Can I just ask the question um, mm -hmm. of Mr. Hoffman? I, I assume that you guys looked into the possibility of obviously putting the second story on the garage. I, I would anticipate that just because of of structural reasons or some reason you you pulled away from that idea. I mean, that's obviously the the more typical type mm -hmm. of ADU scenario that we have seen presented. Absolutely, that's that's correct. So um, that was the first thing that we considered. However. Um, it's a the garage that's virtually new since 2017 is a typical garage in that uh, it's sitting on a uh, slab on grade with a thickened you know sort of perimeter and it doesn't have a proper foundation under it that would be required for um, uh, doing a two-story structure and you know we even entertained a couple of ideas of <laughs> you know of, you know how we could frame you know using piers and columns and it just became sort of unfeasible um, so short of demoing the existing garage and starting from scratch uh, at that footprint um, adding a, a habitable uh, livable space above it uh, wasn't structurally feasible And then just also given the recent investment in that garage, I think, you know, if the garage had been, you know, 50 years old or was in really poor shape, uh, the conversation may have gone a different direction. But. And have, has your client um, had open conversations with the neighbor since it is going to be a direct impact on their on their lighting and their privacy, has that come? Have have there has there been any communication between the two? I I don't know. I can't speak to that. Um, however, my client has communicated to us that we, you know, they want to be as sensitive as possible uh, to their neighbor, uh, given the proximity. So, again, which is why which prompted us to go and and uh, survey and uh, side of that I, building and, and, and take into consideration the placement of our window. I would like, I would like to, to say a word about that. We, we consider mm -hmm. um, us very good neighbors and friends mm -hmm. and so on. And over the summer, our neighbors informed us that they are thinking about putting a second floor or whatever on the garage. And uh, we we're fine with that, of course, and not that we have anything to do with it. But we heard for the first time uh, on Friday when we got the postcard and, and we then, um, we contacted our neighbors ahead of this meeting whether we could have a talk with them and we told them that we would raise the concerns today and we we were really kind of very dismayed and very shocked um, that that um, these plans are there we have never seen these plans all we have is the postcard from the city of Evanston okay. all right can I ask a question of Mr. Hoffman did you actually do the equivalent of a cost benefit analysis of ripping down the existing garage and building a totally new structure. It seems to me that the footprint of the garage with no foundation under it versus the footprint of the new addition, which would, I assume, have a full foundation either with a basement or a crawl space, uh, has got to be equivalent. So, what you would be, uh, you, you know, you could certainly reuse the garage door, you could reuse the windows. Uh, I bet you the uh, construction cost of what you would be throwing away would be in the twenty to maybe twenty to thirty thousand dollar 
cost, but that there might even be a net wash uh, when you look at uh, excavation and foundation costs? Uh, we did not do a formal study to, to compare those. Um, I mean, I'm part of, in all honesty, what is also driving us or one of our, one of the um, uh, motivators here is, you know, being as green and energy efficient as possible. And the idea of tearing down a brand new structure, uh, even those elements of it could be salvaged and reused, um, uh, was not a, a an immediate thought. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it just didn't I, seem like the green, greenest solution. But we, yeah. but in all fairness, we did not do a cost analysis. Uh, excuse me a second. Yeah, this is uh, this is Dave Forte. I'm Ralph's colleague and uh, another architect on this project. I wanted to address Mr. Cohen's comments just to say that. Um, Part of this, um, while we didn't do a full bore cost analysis, we do have EDC has a, a contractor on staff and we had many discussions with the contractor in regard to the anticipated cost of doing this or that. As Ralph described, we were at times talking about putting columns through the garage. But you know, part of this is also driven as typical with any, any design project, any architecture project, the clients you know, want certain things and we try to follow those. Um, and one aspect of it is the garage is actually a fairly nice garage. It's, it's pretty enhanced. The client has a workshop in there. So there were aspects of that that we're trying to abide to and keeping, keeping those aspects separated from the ADU. So there were program requirements from the client that were driving the design too. Okay. All right, well, why don't we turn, Ken, did you have something you were trying to say before we decided um, to do Well, I guess the, my other question to the designers, uh, I mean, obviously your zoning compliant look, looking just at your lot alone, um, but obviously the zoning sort of presumes that your neighbor is also compliant. Um, in this instance, they're not, their, their setback is zero. I wonder if, is there a way to make your structure work by shifting over kind of the full six feet from the prop, north property line? So that there would be the kind of the six foot separation zoning would imagine is typical. Um, does that, is there a way to shave three feet off the thickness of this or shave three feet off the garage and slide the thing over? Um, is that something you've studied or? You know, rather than, um, I, I mean, I think that's a, a good thought, but why don't we, I, I think we should continue this. I think we should give the, um, applicant the opportunity to at least consider whether there are alternatives that wouldn't be too disruptive of their plan that might be less disruptive to neighbors. And then I know personally, I would like to go uh, walk by the property and get a better sense of it since I didn't appreciate the issue um, before. Would other commissioners support that kind of continuance to see what can be done? I agree with that. Can I state this on behalf of the client? Um, Again, um, the issue, you know, as Ralph clearly described, we really paid attention to the neighbor. Both the owners made it clear to us that they were sensitive to that. W again, we don't have personal relationships with the neighbor. They do. We didn't discover this until tonight that there was minimal discussion about this. But I do know, because I witnessed it, I had discussions with the owner. They're, they were very concerned. <laughs> we did our best considering uh, the parameters. And from a historic preservation standpoint, it sounds like we do have approval. From a zoning building standpoint, as far as we know, we built according to those parameters that Evanston works under. It just so happens, as, as you were saying, the neighbor's building is partially on our client's property. The neighbor's building has the advantage of extra square footage because it's legal non-conforming. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast here. But when we're talking about building and zoning code, I think we comply. Okay. So it, is, is, the, is the decision for the board here, the commission here, are we just talking about historic preservation? Can we work those other aspects out with the building department? Okay, I, I think, um, you know, in the end we'll apply standards in the code. Um, the, um, I mean, one, you know, some of the standards in the code deal not just with the building itself, 
but with the um, relationship to adjacent structures. Um, so I think we just, again, we hear you that you've thought about it, that it's, it's, it's definitely a hard problem. And um, I, I think we'd like to have um, the neighbors have a better chance to look, commissioners, if they wish to, to walk by and get a better sense of it, now that we've heard what the parties are both trying to do. And then if you, you know, it may be that, uh, you know, thinking about it, that you guys think of some solution you hadn't thought about. Um, but, but I think it, it would be better to continue and give everybody a chance at least to try to find the best solution. Um, you know, we, we heard what you're saying though, we, we did hear it. Yeah, and I can tell you narrowing the building by three feet would, would be a deal breaker because it's already fairly narrow and long to try to accommodate the needs uh, of the client. Um, and uh, if we squeeze this anymore, it would be it would be a bowling alley type building. Okay, it, we, we hear yeah. we we hear you. Um, let, yeah. let, if other commissioners are supportive, I you know like to continue, and I think we'd also maybe try to under the, the ADU uh, the the new ordinance has probably unintended consequences like this that nobody's really thought about. Right. So I, I think we I just like to study that a little bit too. Sure. From from a historic but, standpoint, though, does it does it appear that we're in line with uh, the commission? I mean, the concerns aren't about your building per se, but again, yeah. part of um, historic preservation is relationships to to other buildings. So it's at least something we have to think about. I mean, and you know, to be honest, we, we listen to people, we listen to neighbors, we just have to consider it all. And we should just try to do our best. And one more month is an opportunity for everybody to, you know, turn every stone and think if there's any way to help at all here. And, and if, if, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see if there is. Um, the, uh, this is on the Doug Nichols. Specific to the, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. This is the homeowner, the the applicant, I guess that that Dick and Ralph are, are representing. I just had a couple of comments to add. I think, and one question that uh, may or may not be appropriate, but I, I want to ask it anyways. Um, one is just to call out that, like like uh, Ralph said and David said, we obviously were very very concerned, and I say very. Um, aware of potential issues we as as hello mentioned we did bring it up to them over the summer um things got kind of obviously for many of us carried away over the past year um and it was unfortunate that we didn't have a chance to talk to them before they got the postcard but we did talk to them after the postcard on a zoom a very good i thought you know just frank and honest uh discussion around how it's obviously not um happy do it did not make them happier please that it's you know has the potential to close off uh, some of their sunlight and the obstruct their windows. Um, but one thing I did want to call out is that we did look at it. We might not have done a full cost evaluation, but in talking with Dick and talking with their contractor, we did do some rough analysis around what it would take to completely dismantle the garage, put it on, on the other side. And just from a, a cost point of view, we were looking at least those initial um, evaluations that in my mind were that, you know, looking at the $50,000 range or so of, of just completely sunk cost. So um, that's one. I think two is <clears throat> to pull us back as much as possible. I don't remember if it was four feet or not, Ralph, but it was like three and a half or four feet. We ended up, we're going to destroy the north wall of the garage and eat three feet into the garage to help move it over a little bit more than, than you know, as much as we could. So we are kind of, I don't know if it's called a compromise, right? But we are eating into the garage to try to give as much space as possible. I know that probably the hill, Martin, that probably doesn't help you a whole lot, but just to show that, you know, we did put some thought into it and trying to do as much as we can without, again, having to go through that full process of eating um, the cost of destruction and rebuilding the garage, basically. And, and the one other, I guess, question I wanted to raise is, is I think one thing that we had toyed around with with Ralph and the initial designs is just if there's anything we could do with the roofing to help kind of bring down that height while still keeping you know this the structure is ultimately for my parents um, they are originally had a down payment in what's I don't remember the name of the place um, downtown Evanston like a retirement community the Mather um, House, uh, Doug. The Mather House, Andrew. there you go, sorry. Had a down payment there, COVID hit, obviously everything changed. They said, no way, I'm going anywhere near like retirement communities. So um, this was kind of in the works for a while, but this is for them. So, you know, just some of the requirements were two bedrooms. So therefore it turned into a two, two story structure, which wasn't again, part of the original discussion. I think when we had that initial conversation with Hill and Martin, 
But one thing um, that we did talk about was there is there any opportunity for like a flattened roof structure or you know anything else that could help bring that overall height down? And I think Ralph and, and David, the initial responses we got were no, most likely because of this process, because of the preservation society and, and having to kind of conform to the, the roof, the gable structure of the original house. So I didn't know if that's something that could be on the table or, or one of those things that we could look at playing with too. I don't know how much that would help. Um, I think it would potentially bring the roof line down so it wouldn't block at least the upper windows on their house. But just throwing out that as an idea if that's something that we have the ability to maybe adjust or play around with it all. Okay, well, why don't we, you know, those are all good thoughts and I think we, we're not gonna have time to discuss Mark, it. may I make a, a quick comment? I think the roof is irrelevant. I think it's the height of the adjacent wall. I would like to compliment you guys. I think the design is nicely done. I think the presentation was nicely done. And I actually feel that you meet all of the standards, uh, except for one thing, which is not under our purview. Uh, and your presentation indicated that you assumed there was six feet between the two buildings, that you were three feet off the property line. And you said six feet, which assumes that the adjacent building was three feet off the property line. And uh, I find it insensitive that you actually uh, didn't check that out, that you didn't look, that you didn't include the uh, existing uh, context in your site plan. Uh, and if nothing else, I think that the commission is also about the relationship of uh, landmark buildings to adjacent properties and to the uh, neighbors and to the quality of the environment. Okay, um, we've, we've had a good discussion, a lot of um, ideas and um, you know, I mean, hopefully with the month that things will will come into focus and any, you know, if nothing else, there'll be discussion between the parties and commissioners will have the opportunity to review. Um, is, is there any, I mean, do the commissioners generally feel it'd be okay to continue this? Chair Simon, one last clarification that this was actually filed under the old coach house um, ordinance. This this is not related to the new ADU ordinance. I just want to okay. make sure that's clear. All right, thank you. That, that's helpful because we're looking at that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what, is there a commissioner who'd like to make a motion to continue this to the next meeting? Chairman Simon. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Okay. We just, I won't interrupt. We, I'll we talk like later. Nine matters tonight, and again, if commissioners don't want to continue, we won't. I'm just I'm asking. No, I just had a general question before you vote on continuing. I mean, con continuing to the next meeting so the people on the commission can go visit the site? Is that what you're referring to? I, I'd like to do that personally, okay. but I think also to give the parties an opportunity to see if there's, you know, to discuss it and see if there is anything else that can be done that's practical. Yeah, and just, just a comment, Mr. Cohen. I mean, I, I think R Ralph spoke of the six feet, but we've never kept that hidden. The plat of survey is clear, and when we submitted for the building permit, it's clearly on there. It's just that this presentation, we didn't think this was an element. It's, it's our fault, I guess. Uh, we didn't think this was an element of the Preservation Commission in regards to the neighboring property. So it's not. It correct. wasn't intentional. It wasn't intentional. I just want to mention okay. there was no right. intention. You know, on, on the other hand, I, I want to, yeah, first so of all, I want to thank we the. Uh, we, we, need to move. we need to move on. We've got several more matters and other people to speak, and it doesn't sound like we're going to be voting. I, I mean, is there any commissioner would like to make a different motion? I just, I, I can't see everybody's faces. Um, let, let's, let's continue this. I'll, I'll make a motion that we uh, continue the case at, uh, sorry, I lost the address, 929 Sherman Avenue to the meeting of January 12th. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second, Susie. Okay, a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Idle? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Morris? Aye. Commissioner Bodan? Aye. Commissioner Reinhold? Aye. And I'm an aye. Um, all right. And um, Kate, I guess if they have questions in the interim about um, what the parties can do to maximize the opportunity for a decision at the next meeting. They can, I guess, contact you or um, hopefully at some point, Carlos. 
Yes, yeah, they can they can reach out to me. Okay, great. Okay, All thank right. you, everybody. Thank you. I'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Um, the thank next you. matter was um, 1208 Ashland Avenue. Is there an applicant here to speak to 1208 Ashland? That was the same property, right? The... It is, yeah, it's the same property that on uh, the previous case for window replacements was reviewed, yeah. I don't know if I see him on the participant list. Um, all right, well, I guess we've, Maybe we'll, again, just come back to that and um, Forest Avenue by the end of the turn out. Um, the next matter is 1227 Greenwood Street. Are the uh, yes, I'm uh, Peter Kading, the architect for 1227 Greenwood Street. Yes, uh, and, uh, and I'm Guy Elgat, one of the applicants. My wife is here with me, Valerie Sternberg. Uh, so this project is a corner lot at Greenwood and Asbury. It's an existing uh, home that I believe is from 1959. It's, uh, if you could go down a couple more, there's a site plan with a little bit of context. Um, right there, that, that one's great. Uh, it's in a group of about nine homes that are all of about the same vintage. This one is a single story home with uh, three bedrooms and two baths. The owners are proposing to add a second story to add a new master suite and a additional bedroom slash office on the second floor. Um, they are proposing to change the look of the house to a more modern style with flat roofs. Um, the Basic configuration of the house as it stands is the eastern portion is there's a garage that faces green wood with a family room behind it. The middle section consists of a living room, kitchen and dining room. And then the western portion is currently three bedrooms and the two bathrooms along with the entry. Um, the If we move sort of down towards the, the elevations, I can explain those a little bit. Uh, so you can see the garage section that's on the east there where we've removed the gabled roof and left that at sort of the lowest height. The current ceiling height on the first floor is about eight feet. Um, in the middle section there, it steps up a little bit to include the uh, higher ceiling in the living room. And the, then the western section includes the entryway, the stair up to the new second floor and the bedrooms. The bedrooms are currently about a nine foot ceiling. Um, so we're not looking for a lot of space there, but we're trying to keep the overall height of the building low. Um, as the neighbor to the north is fairly close to, to this building, um, our, uh, our building is set about six and a half feet to the south of that lot line. And I think the other buildings uh, six and a half, seven feet. Um, you can, uh, uh, and I should mention when we're talking about this elevation that uh, the sort of three windows on the towards the west portion, uh, the two lower ones are an existing opening size that we hope to put new uh, Ultrex gliders in that uh, will fill that size. They'll also be egress compatible compared to the existing windows, which are. I don't know if they're original windows, but they are an aluminum window and they're an aluminum true divided light as far as I can tell. Um, they have aluminum storms and there are a variety of casements and some fixed windows. Um, the windows on the west side of the building, they're actually the two 
outer sections are casement and the metal section is fixed. Uh, continuing down through the elevations, um, this is the Asbury elevation um, where we've added the second story. We've increased those window sizes on the, the ground level there to match the front. Um, the current bedroom situation on the, the first floor to the north and the south, there's one bedroom. Um, and the north bedroom doesn't currently have any egress windows, so we we're hoping to make the windows match and give us some, uh, you know, version of egress compliant windows. Uh, continuing down in the drawings. Um, the rear elevation is a combination of existing window openings um, on the first floor, one new window opening where there was previously a door um, and then a small second story window. On the uh, continuing down to the next elevation, please. Uh, the east elevation uh, in the existing house maintains the existing openings. Uh, the window on the left of the, is to the garage, the, as is the door. The next window is to an existing laundry room. And then the pair of sliders there is a more modern slider, some sort of a hella wooden slider that must have been put on in um, at a more recent time. Uh, to the next uh, slide down shows uh, the relationship between the neighbors to both the east on the top there. So we're quite a ways uh, to the neighbor out in the east. Um, the lot, since it's a corner lot, is set up as if Asbury Street is the front yard, although the house faces Greenwood and, it, you know, it, in practice, practice, the Greenwood would look like the front yard. But there's a large rear yard, as it might be on the, the Greenwood Street side there. Um, on the Asbury side, the house to the north is quite a bit closer. Uh, the garage is about, from my dimension, about 19 feet. Um, the majority of the new second story aligns with the garage, just past the garage there, where you can see the outline of the gable. That uh, does have some large windows, and past that, the house does, uh, the neighbor's house does set back. Both of those occur primarily against the lower roofs over the living room and then over the family room to the east of there. So we did try and step it down a little bit to maximize the light between these houses. Um, we can keep going through down. Uh, this I is can't a. Do it. Start video. No, 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 baby. <laughs> Sorry, uh, wasn't sure where that was coming from. Um, this is a, a sort of overall rendering uh, from close to the corner of Greenwood and Asbury, and then we can scroll down a little bit more. I think this is uh, somewhere between a rendering and an elevation, showing the height of the building pretty closely to the neighboring neighbor's uh, house and garage. Uh, this one shows the front elevation of the house on Greenwood and then the distance to the neighbor's house to the east. And then I think there's maybe one or two more. This is looking west so you can see the neighbors. Uh, I'm not sure what room it is, but they do have some, some windows under the peak there. And like I said, those occur primarily next to the middle section of the house where the, it's not a full two stories. Uh, and then this rendering shows the view looking east on Greenwood. Um, the owners would like to propose to redo the exterior in a white stucco, um, which in some of the photos, there are a number of houses that are obviously stucco in the area including a couple new houses just down on Asbury to the 
south. And then the Unitarian Church, which you can see in the distance to the right there is a combination of stucco and smooth concrete or painted concrete. I'm not sure exactly what they've done over the years there, but it's the appearance is pretty similar. Um, so yeah, this is then just a series of pictures. Uh, the top row is the view from of our house to the, from the corner going to the east. Uh, so the neighbor immediately to the east is a single story sort of red brick um, ranch style. And then on the corner at Greenwood and Ridge, there's another single story ranch that's probably more similar to our house. Um, the Unitarian Church, obviously, uh, and then in the middle row there, and then the two houses next door to that. And then the bottom row here are the houses on Asbury going to the south and the two houses I mentioned in both in stucco and the house, uh, the last house obviously with a, a portion of a roof with a parapet on it. Um, the last page I think is some more photos that shows our house in the upper right with the neighbor with the garage facing Asbury. And then 1415 Asbury is another house that faces, uh, the garage faces Asbury, but that one is a two-story uh, version of, of these 1950s houses. Uh, the rest of the pictures show additional houses on the west side of Asbury. Okay. Um... Is that it for the uh, presentation? Yeah, that's it for my initial presentation. Um, are there questions from commissioners? I imagine there are. There is some public comment as well, Chair. Yeah, okay. M maybe, I I'm wondering if questions from commissioners will help elucidate what's being built and what we can see and what's hard to see before we go to the public. Do any commissioners have questions? Mute. I know, and maybe the, the um, those more knowledgeable about technical matters than I am can pick this up. I I, I just wondered if the plan was um, sufficient to really get a sufficient idea of what the structure was going to look like when it was done. It just looked very non-specific to me. Uh, a comment or a question or? Well, it's a question for my fellow commissioners who have more okay. expertise in architectural matters than I do. Sure. I, I guess where you're going with that comment is kind of the, um, kind of what's the, the next level of detail we'd see in the actual finished product. Um, it's essentially drawn in the renderings as if it's a pristine white box. We all know that that's not exactly possible. Um, understanding that it's gonna be stucco wall cladding everywhere. Can you talk a little more about kind of how you intend to treat some of the transitions and termination details? Um, what would we actually see at kind of the, a little finer grained level of detailing? Uh, the, the owner, you know, as currently drawn, you know, wanted to primarily be a smooth stucco, you know, box with, it would have additional metal detailing on it. Um, they are proposing uh, black windows and black sheet metal trim. Um, they would like to do a glass railing on that upper deck that I guess I, I didn't quite mention, but the deck that shows up off the bedroom on the, the second floor. Uh, and yes, there could be some additional detailing shown. It is somewhat difficult to effectively render white stucco because it appears like white stucco, especially at, at, at this scale, um, or you know, smooth white paint. I suppose it looks like. Uh, so yes, that that's a question, or if there's a comment that there's something, a direction that you're you're interested in seeing, that we would take that to heart. Not necessarily a direction, just wanting to understand what's what's being proposed. So kind of. Um, how do you how do you envision kind of the window details working? Is it um, um, what happens where the window meets the stucco? Is there a trim or is there a setback? The stucco wraps into the opening. How what's some of the detailing for those transitions? 
Like, yes, I, 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 I'm imagining that the stucco would, would return into the windows. Um, the first floor is, you know, existing painted masonry. So we have existing masonry openings that we'll be working with um, that they would hope to, you know, apply stucco to, to give it this smooth finish that they're, they're desiring. Um, so the, the detail is fairly minimal as currently intended. How do we get these guys in here? All right, um, why don't we, well, commissioners are considered, why don't we turn, are, are there members of the public who came to speak tonight? I know there were some written submissions, but is anybody here to speak? Someone's there? speaking for you, aren't they? I don't know if you can hear me. I'm Barbara Hesterberg. Um, okay, we hear you. Yeah, and you, okay, I, I can't get the video. I'm very unused to doing this. <laughs> In fact, I've never done it before. So I did write a lengthy written comment and Cade Sterling has it. I don't know if he read it into the minutes yet or not, but um, we also learned about this dramatic difference in uh, renovation only by postcard. And we were shocked to say the least because it looks like nothing else in the neighborhood. And I know there's a referral to the two stucco houses down the street, but they are just discreetly situated and they have gables and they have nice windows. And, um, you know, they're also, um, the only thing you see of them is the facade. This on the corner of 1227 is every direction and it is so glaring um we were just very upset and i think if if Cade reads my my comments um i don't want to repeat myself here but um it's really it feels so unacceptable <laughs> so unacceptable to this neighborhood you know because we are one of 18 houses actually that were built um between 1949 and 1959 and uh, we're bordered by Greenwood, Asbury, Lake, and Ridge. And we all face a different way and we all have weird addresses even though we don't face the street uh, that we live on. <laughs> but um, uh, I've lost my train of thought. But um, anyhow, it just doesn't look like anything, anything at all. Okay, and Kate did circulate to all of us the um your written statement so we have yeah and have, the, you know the stark wall and the rear elevation for a second floor it's just well it's just very distasteful so <laughs> that's all i have to say right now as long as you've seen my comments um yes i leave it to you thank you thank you were, were there other members of the public here anybody else want to speak Um, okay, and I think that the written um, statements that Kate had circulated included, my recollection is both people who were uh, for the project and people who were against the project. And um, Correct, I think I only had um, one comment. Oh, I did have another comment. I don't know if Nadine Warner is on the call, um, but she wrote in favor she says she's excited to welcome the family to the neighborhood and think the modifications they're proposing will preserve the uniformity of the area. Um, these modifications include the addition of Gables Rose renovation. Could you, could you explain the, the uh, modifications include the addition of Gables to the proposed renovation? The, the drawings indicate that the uh, renovation is all flat roofed, so I didn't understand that. Yeah, I don't understand her comments necessarily. Um, she she related to uh, uh, other yeah. houses around the corner that are um, modern stucco structures. Possibly, I mean, I know which house Nadine lives in. She's in the other two-story house, two, uh, two doors to the north. Um, so, and I believe Mrs. Hesterberg is the, obviously the house, one house to the north. So I think she's the next house after that. Um, I'm not sure 
what you know what what Gables has to do with it, other than maybe it's a misdescription of the second floor in, in some fashion. This this is another neighbor. We're the Aherns. We're also we're actually right across the street from Nadine. Would it be possible just to go back up to the plans a little bit more right now um, on the screen sharing? We're just viewing all the all the neighbor houses. Thank you so much. Maybe down two slides might be a good one, Parker. Maybe that right there. Okay, let me ask uh, one last time. Is there any other, anyone else from the public who hasn't spoken yet who wishes to speak? This is the Aherns again. Um, Could you just, I'm sorry, state your name. My name is Carla Ahern, and Thank we're you. at 1426 Asbury across the street. Did you want us to, to make a remark or? Yeah, this is the first that we're seeing of the detailed plans outside of the uh, postcard. And, you know, we also wanted to say, welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you so much for, um, you know, taking the time to restore the house. I think there, this has a lot of potential. I guess my husband and I are just a little bit concerned and, and, and actually agree with Mrs. Hesterberg that I don't know that it kind of fits in as is that it fits into the rest of the block right now, especially since it's, you know, so much on display on the corner right there. Um, as Mrs. Hesterberg referenced the other two houses that are also, you know, kind of the smooth um, stucco are a little bit more tucked away and you just don't see them quite as much. That's a busier block of Asbury just to the south of us. So um, it's a little bit of a hard comparison for us to draw. Um, we're very excited <laughs> about the house. We're very excited to welcome new neighbors. It just doesn't quite fit as is, um, just to sort of what I've <laughs> grown to uh, to get used to sort of in the neighborhood. That, that's all, I don't know. It just feels a little bit off to me visually. I'm sorry, I'm torn. <laughs> all right, um, any discussion by commissioners? Um, I have a question. There were two other stucco houses in the historic district that were mentioned. Do we know the construction dates and if those were originally stucco or if those are um, additions as well? They're both new construction. And I think they're within the last uh, five or six years. Oh, thank you. Uh, they, they are, I mean, I don't know if you saw the pictures, they are somewhat more, I mean, they don't have a flat roof is the big difference. They're um, somewhat more um, compatible with, uh, I mean, across the street to the west um, from this house, uh, from Greenwood House on Ridge is all the, you know, the big Victorians. Um, any discussion by commissioners about what we want to do? Go ahead, Stuart. Um, yeah, I'm new to the commission. Uh, I, uh, uh, Elliot Dudnick and Julie Hacker uh, uh, have gone off the commission and they are hard acts to follow. But uh, in terms of the amount that I have to say about this project, uh, I'm gonna uh, make an effort, uh, you know, while I agree that the house uh, is radically different from all of the things that are around it, uh, one of the things about the standards for review is that they are intended to be style blind. They evaluate elements of visual continuity with the underlying assumption that we value the urbanity of our streets in addition to the visual variety of houses built at different times. Having said that, I have some question whether this total transformation of a 1950s ranch house should be evaluated using the standards for alteration or the standards for uh, new construction. Uh, it applied under alteration. So I think uh, what I did was to go through each of those standards with respect to the house uh, 
And I find that uh, standard one is not met because the project requires more than minimal alteration of the property. Standard two is not met because the distinguishing characteristics of the original are destroyed. And I think uh, as a general discussion at some point, there's a need to return to one and two and ask since the 1950s ranch houses along Greenwood are 50 years old, if they constitute a historic style with their own integrity and are worth preserving. Uh, I find that three, five, six, and 10 are not met and that four, seven, and eight do not apply. And nine, which says it does not discourage um, uh, different and innovation, innovative approaches. Uh, while it's ostensibly met, I'm not sure that this architectural vocabulary is, is something innovative in the sense that it's actually a pretty well-known style of architecture at this point. Uh, if we look at the project for the standards of review for new construction, uh, and I guess that would assume that the project was resubmitted, I feel that standard uh, one, which has to do with the height relationship to adjacent buildings, is actually met, even though uh, much of the street are low ranch houses. And the reason I feel that is that the three corner houses are two stories high, and having a two-story mass on the fourth corner, I think, seems like a good decision and a good relationship. Uh, the proportion of the facades is met with respect to the other corner houses, that is the height to width ratio, uh, uh, but certainly not with respect to the remaining uh, one story ranch houses that are to the east of the property along the street. The proportion of openings is clearly not met. The proposal is dramatically different uh, in both size and compositional arrangement. Uh, rhythm number four is rhythm to solids uh, and voids in the facade, and that's clearly not met although I would complement the uh, corner roof terrace, which does recognize the diagonal orientation of the house to that corner. Uh, number five is a rhythm and spacing between structures, uh, which has been, uh, have, I think has been met, you know, the, the, the spacing seems reasonable. And the whole idea that there should be a continuity of building fronts along the street is met but I think more as a result of a required setback as opposed to design. Uh, number seven, I feel is met as there are both old and new stucco houses in the block, particularly uh, east of the site along Asbury. Uh, roof shapes clearly not met. And here again, it's been mentioned, but I would urge you to look at the two new stucco houses on the east side of Ridge between Dempster and Greenwood that I think do a better job of meeting the standards with respect to roof shapes and three uh, proportion of openings. Uh, 10 and 11 uh, are met and 12 and 13 do not apply. Uh, and having run through the last set of criteria, I'm making the assumption that you might want the option of uh, reapplying as uh, under, under the uh, evaluations for new construction. Uh, you know, it, your, the project might have a better chance of receiving approval under those standards, but uh, uh, my feeling is that as a uh, uh, application for, uh, uh, for an alteration that does not meet the uh, list of standards uh, for a certificate of appropriateness. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I, I think you do raise an interesting question in that, does this group of housings in their sort of 1950s presentation show something that needs to be maintained for this project to be approved one way or another? Or are there options to change this house to something that is newer, such as uh, other stucco houses that down the block? And I. I you know, when you read these standards, it's sometimes hard to see what direction they, they, you know, intend to take you for a group of houses like this that are, you know, not 
originally contributing to the, the Ridge Historic District, but they obviously all have since been, you know, they group together and they do have a, a similar visual style. So um, I, I guess that is a place of confusion for me. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is the starting point is that um, we have to accept, first of all, that the existing house is non-contributing and that such a drastic transformation is even within the ballpark. I mean, I guess personally, I'm comfortable with that as a starting point, um, but I think Stuart raises a good point that the transformation is so total, we almost just have to review this as a, a new construction. Um, regardless of the fact that some of the physical fabric of the 1950s house would still be there within the new shell. Um, looking at it from those standards, I think the the problematic standards for me are the materiality. I think the um, while there are examples of stucco houses in the district, they typically have a little more variety and articulation as opposed to just uh, completely covering every um, every surface in every direction with a uniform um, unarticulated palette of stucco with no trim and uh, um, kind of trying to make it all like a, a monolith like it was carved from a single block of granite. Um, I think that materiality is a problem that's standard seven and I think standard eight the roof line is a is a problem there's really um, there are some commercial or institutional buildings in that area that have flat roofs, but the residential structures do typically have have sloped roofs, and I I, I kind of question the the flat roof appearance of, of this structure. Just I'll leave it there. Uh, just to clarify, so the application was made under both the standards for alteration and construction, and the um, yeah, I mean I yeah, I think we hit the issues under the standards for construction. I mean there are. You know, there is a section which is one of the, the sections which is um, under which permission is sought, which you know, says innovative design for a new construction and additions to existing property should not be discouraged. Um, and then goes on, but there's certainly other standards that, you know, for, for additions, the distinguishing original qualities um, should be preserved. And I think, you know, it, the, the question of whether, you know, what kind of preservation standards we should be applying to these 1950s houses and you know, preserving the relationship to the surrounding similar houses is a hard one. I don't know that we, I mean, it's a hard one to resolve. Um, but I guess um, given the almost, I don't wanna say conflict, but, but it really is a conflict between preserving existing structures and having an innovative design. I guess I'd like to see, I mean, I think there is room for an innovative design and there is room for change. But I think I'd like to see more relationship to um, the existing house and or um, surrounding structure, something in between, you know, that, that captures both. To, to other so, yeah, yes, something in between. Um, and I, that's really my question is, you know, is this an avenue to, you know, is there other support for something in between or is it, it really something where once we head down that path that we're always something in between and we never get to something that anybody's happy with or are we trying to, you know, maintain this 1950s house, which, you know, has a bunch of layers on it now, you know, it's vinyl, the, the siding you see is vinyl, you know, the, the windows are these, like I said, these sort of divided light aluminum windows that I could look around and sort of guess as to what maybe they were there. It's pretty interesting if you walk in that street, there are the different types of windows we see. There's some steel windows there. There are casement windows, there are you know, double hungs and they have, some of them are divided light and not. Um, so I always feel uh, you know, a little bit leery when I go back and sort of start inventing things for a house like this. Um, I don't think I could replicate these windows, you know, if I tried there, somebody sold them these windows at some point, And I think they shortly went out of business after that. But um, so yeah, that the, the something in between is, is, is interesting, or do I really need to try and, you know, delve into this 1950s vernacular and sort of, uh, you know, get that I can go two houses down and I can find a pretty good example of a two story 
you know, house like this, it's a little bit different orientation and the, the second story set back above the garage a little bit, but I think, it, you know, I would have a pretty strong case for that. It would end up with a fairly tall gable on, on Asbury there, as opposed to the much lower flat roof. And I totally understand the, the comments about the flat roof. It's just, um, you know, I think as a practical measure that uh, a lot of these ranch houses do need some renovation and some additional space. And, you know, how we achieve that is a interesting question. So. Yeah. I, I think one way to think about it is if the uh, ranch house uh, that you're uh, proposing to alter uh, were to come before the commission for a certificate of appropriateness, uh, and we looked at it in relation to all of the existing older homes, we would probably deny it. On the, we should not tell you how to design this house, but you should also keep in mind that the two newer stucco houses that are on Asbury both received uh, certificates of, pro of appropriateness and that they have uh, uh, elements that uh, relate them, uh, I think, uh, to the uh, uh, existing fabric of houses on the street. Thank you. I mean, it just, you know, it's a little bit of context. I mean, New new construction, particularly with innovative new construction, um, poses hard difficulties both for the commission and obviously you hear from neighbors. And this is a something that happens over and over. <coughs> it's, it's very challenging. Um, I don't envy the job you have to do to, to do it. And, and again, nobody's discouraging you from doing a good job. I mean, we're not saying slavishly follow elements of other homes just to follow them. Um, but but typically it is a process of trying both to accomplish what you want and being pleased with the work. Um, and at the same time, trying to um, have a little less harsh relationship to what's around it. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say 90% of the time, proposals for new construction that are very innovative do have to come back because that's really hard. It's a, it's a hard job. I don't you know, envy how hard it is. I also appreciate how difficult it is having gone through, you know, or observing several of these exercises. For me, I just, it's um, the hard angles and the aesthetic of the 50s ranch really pulls in all of these diagonals. So if there was some way to sort of pull that all together, it might tie things together in a way that's acceptable for everybody. Yeah, a couple of the guidelines for new construction are for construction, and they talk about preserving the character, not just the look. Um, and I think if, if the character of the new design can maybe capture some of what's originally there in the ranch, that would help. Um, I do appreciate that, I mean, in this view here, you can see that the fenestration is actually mimicked and, and, and enhanced with the second floor. Um, and so I appreciate those kind of details and, and that, you know, preservation of that part of the character, but I think just that overall design. Um, yeah, the standards of the original qualities and the innovative design on the construction side, as well as some of the more specific ones at the beginning of both the alteration and the construction, then those are just kind of stopping points for me as well. Okay, I think we'd like to give you an opportunity to consider and, and if you need more than a month, that's okay. I mean, do you want to continue for a month and then if you, I mean, I, you know, no, I don't think, I think we all realize this is, is a hard problem and if you need sure. it, that would be okay. Okay, Did you thank you. Continue for a month and then see what happens. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that obviously would be fine. And then I assume we can contact Carlos and, and ask to move it past that, so. Yeah, I mean, I think we all appreciate that it's a big construction job and that it, it's a hard problem and it may take longer. All right. Um, why don't we? Um... May I? May I please uh, just quickly ask a question, if that's okay? Sure. So I'm um, just to get a better understanding of what we're trying to aim at here. So would a slanted roof approximate this in between that you mentioned? Because it sounded to me like the perhaps the chief problem was the flat roof. So just to get a better sense of what exactly we would be trying to aim at, is that something that would appease the concerns 
of the commission, the committee members? I, I don't think we should tell you how to design the house. I mean, obviously the flat roof is only found in this house, but I don't think, you know, again, I think it's a, it's a problem you guys should consider and it's not like we should tell you mechanically what to design. Okay. Um, yes, I'm just trying to understand what, exa how we, what exactly should we have before our mind, so to speak, in trying to, you know, uh, find a, a suitable solution here. I, I think it, it, we can't tell you how to design it and it would be a bad idea and probably lead to a bad design. I think you, you guys have heard the feedback. I think the architect understands the feedback. And then, um, you know, there are many, many different ways you could design this project that would you know, you know, potentially get approval. Thank you. And I, 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 yeah, refer back to the standards, which have a lot of um, guidance as to what we're, what we're looking at. Um, okay, would somebody like to make a motion to continue? I can do it. Go ahead, Beth. Sure. I move to um, continue the um, application for the certificate of appropriateness for the property at 1227 Greenwood Street in the Ridge Historic District, case 20 Prez 0315. Um, the certificate of appropriateness it was for proposing to renovate the existing first floor, replace all windows with new, um, tear down the roof and add a second floor um, and finish the entire building in white smooth stucco. Applicable, applicable standards, alterations one through 10, construction one through eight and 10 through 15 and demolition one through six. And we're proposing to continue it to the January 2021 meeting. A uh, second? I'll second. Okay, so it's second. Um, okay, so roll call vote. Um, Co Commissioner Idle? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Morris? Aye. Commissioner Bowden? Aye. Commissioner Reinhold? Aye. And I'm an aye. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next matter is 1323 Elmwood. Yeah, hello. Shut it off. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I don't know where my video went. All right, there we go. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Benjamin Tuning. I'm the uh, contractor for Sean Casey. Um, what I'm proposing for his home is, it, it is a landmark home. Uh, from my understanding, it was built in 1889. He currently has a uh, cedar shake roof, and I'm proposing to go to an asphalt shingle uh, made by CertainTeed. That shingle is Landmark Pro, which is CertainTeed shingle um, that most closely resembles cedar shake. Uh, most of their other designer shingles kind of mimic um, slate uh, and things like that. Uh, the Landmark Pro is an upgraded architectural shingle. I know architectural is pretty standard now, moving on from three tab. Um, so this shingle is heavier. It's 270 pounds per square. So it's thicker to give it more of a dimensional look. Obviously, no asphalt shingle is going to match the, uh, the thickness of cedar. Um, I did include some photos of just the uh, front, rear, right and left slopes. Um, as far as from the street view, there's pretty much mostly only the, the porch roof it is visible from the street. You do get sections of the right and left slope as well, but uh, minimal. Um, the homeowner's biggest concern for wanting to switch is he was dropped by his insurance just due to um, having a cedar roof that's over 10 years old. They didn't actually even address the condition of the roof. They just said, since his roof was over 10 years old and cedar, they, they would no longer cover him. Um, and then he did have a, a difficult time finding new homeowners insurance. So I think that is his main concern. Um, and then my reason for, you know, offering this switch is just the, 
cedar does last a long time. I mean, it's going to be a 40 or 50 year roof if maintained properly. Um, the problem with our climate where you get the mat, like extreme temperature differences and humidity, uh, cedar requires a lot more maintenance in order to, to have it last at 40 or 50 years. Um, so that's, that's essentially what I'm proposing. I did mock up not the exact home, but a similar looking home. Um, as far as siding and everything else with uh, asphalt shingle that's in weathered wood. And then also there's a, a color that is um, specific to Landmark Pro, which is prairie wood, which is supposed to mimic a solid stain cedar shingle. Um, so I don't know if you would like me to share my screen, but I can kind of show you those mock-ups. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. It's kind of straightforward, I guess. Is this what you, you want to show us the material you're proposing? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so I can share my screen and um, at least just show you the. So you guys have these pictures, front elevation, left elevation, rear. Uh, right. And so this would be, again, this is not his home. It's just kind of a similar one that I, I mocked up. Um, this is the, uh, hold on, let me look real quick. So the, this is the prairie wood shingle. It's more reddish. Again, this is kind of more to mimic um, a solid stain cedar where, it, you know, versus the cedar generally tends to gray out. Um, this is weathered wood, so this is kind of more to mimic a, a newer cedar shingle prior to graying out. Um, that was just give a, a rough idea of look on the home. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, and I think the insurance did mention as well, um, the, the class rating, um, as far as like the cedar shingles go, they were, I think that was their main concern is like their, their fire rating for, for dropping um, Mr. Casey. Uh, I know the, the asphalt shingles have a class A rating. You can achieve a class A rating with, with cedar shingles, depending on what they're treated with. And then also, um, certain underlayments used as well. Okay, so the, um, the, the write-up in the historical inventory for this you know, landmark home um, states that it had cedar um, roofing at the time. Is there any evidence that the replacement with this material would relate to some historic material? Uh, replacement with the asphalt material? Yes. No, no. I mean, solely the fact that CertainTeed's goal with this shingle is to mimic Cedar Shake. Uh, th that would be, as far as, yeah, historic. There's nothing, nothing that I can think of anyways, other than mimicking the look of, of Cedar Shake. Yeah. Um, questions from commissioners? Um, before we move to discussion, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to this matter? Uh, discussion by commissioners? I mean, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll guess I'll, I'll go first since no one's jumping in, but um, obviously it is a change in material. The, the cedar would have been presumably the original material when it was constructed up till now. That being said, I, I don't think the, the cedar shingle roofing um, is particularly character defining as compared to like the, the nicely cut shingles for the siding are much more important and those are not part of this. I think the roofing as a cedar shingle roof was kind of just the default when the house was built. Um, and certainly all of the many of the other neighboring houses went through a similar transformation where people give up on a wood shingle roof and go with the asphalt shingle. Um, I think the 
particular product that's being proposed is pretty visually compatible with with the original appearance. Um, so while it is a a loss of an original material, I, I think it's uh, it's understood that roofing is replaced from time to time, and that this this type of substitution is pretty common. I mean, I I would I'll disagree. I mean, and, and I I definitely went by this house and looked. I mean, the um, the appearance of the um, architectural shingle is a great deal more, um, you know, kind of looks much more machine made. Um, there are a considerable number of other houses around it that have a considerable number of houses in Evanston um, that have the cedar shingle that um, I can tell you from firsthand knowledge are definitely insurable. Maybe the, you know, maybe 40 or 50 year old cedar that needs to be replaced might raise fire issues, but a, a very large number of us in Evanston have the cedar shake and we generally have required that um, people maintain the historic material of the cedar on a considerable number of houses. And, and I don't know, personally, I, I think the difference in appearance is considerable. Um, and again, this is a landmark home. Um, if it were not a landmark home, I might um, feel differently. Excuse me, Mr. Tuning. Um, in this yes. picture that's up on the screen, is the roof that's on the neighboring building, is that the same kind of material that you're proposing for the, um, for the, um, your client? Uh, similar material, but it would be a different look. So the shingle that I'm proposing is an upgraded shingle to um, what the what the neighbor current. Well, I guess what both neighbors currently have. I think they kind of have more of an entry level shingle. Uh, this one again is is thicker and it comes with um, max def coloring. So again, to just kind of mimic that cedar shake look. Um, I think the other issue too, as far as maintaining a shake roof on a house, on a two-story house with a 12-12 roof just becomes um, one expensive, which I know doesn't really matter it being a landmark home, uh, but two, just also the, the liability is, is much greater as well. And I do think there are pretty limited views of the actual shake roof itself from line of sight on, on the street. I mean, more or less his neighbors are the ones kind of staring at his roof. Will the front porch roof be replaced? Yes. And I will say too, I, in my original proposal, I didn't include an um, open valley. So if you um, go to the right slope of the roof, there is an open valley, which is just common install methods for, for Cedar Shake. Um, and that's something that I could, I would like to incorporate in actually, just looking at it. So open valley just being metal versus just like a closed cut valley with an asphalt shingle. Again, just kind of more staying with the <clears throat> aesthetic of, of cedar shake. Just May I ask I, a I question? Of. You continue to say cedar shake, yet the roof we're looking at is a cedar shingle. There is a big difference. You mean shingle, I assume. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, any other discussion? No, I guess, may, uh, would somebody like to make a motion to approve and vote on it? Go ahead, Ken. You're not muted, but it, we can't hear you. I'll, uh, I'll make a motion. Uh, for the uh, certificate of appropriateness for 1323 Elmwood Avenue to replace the existing uh, cedar shingle roof with a new asphalt shingle roof. Uh, standards for alteration one through 10 apply. Um, okay, a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, all right, roll we'll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Idle? Uh, aye. Commissioner Cohen? Sadly, I agree, agree with Ken. This is what we are uh, asked to settle for these days for cost and other reasons, and I'll vote aye. Commissioner Morris? Aye. Commissioner Bowden? No. Commissioner Reinhold? No. And I'm a no. Um, so I guess if it's three to three, it's 
just not pass, right? Correct. Go to the runner. I did not pass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and just to confirm for the applicant, if you do want to um, replace the material with a current material, you do not need our approval. Okay, but that's more or less his only option moving forward then? And we, we can't tell you what's your only option. We only vote on what was presented. But I mean, it, it. Th there are a great number of houses that come before. And to be honest, I think if we've required a, 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 you know, a large number of homeowners to maintain their currently existing materials on landmark homes. So I, you know, just even as a matter of consistency and treatment of everybody the same, it, I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know that that would be something different would be approved, but, you know, again, you're free to apply on a, any basis you want. Um, thank you. Yep, uh, thank you for your time. Um, good evening. Um, the next matter up is 2009 Dodge. Is there somebody here to present 2009 Dodge? All right, I think we'll come back one last time at the end to the, I, th I think it's now three and then continue them if we need to. So can I just make a comment on 2009 Dodge, Mark, just for the minutes. Yeah. So I actually went to visit this project and we requested some additional information on the siding detailing. I'm not sure if that was received by Kate or from Carlos, but that might be the reason why um, the applicant isn't here to speak for it. I have not received any anything. Um, and I assume if Carlos had, he would have sent it to me. And I've, I've looked through his email and not received it either recently, so. Should we just, maybe we should just continue well, now? Yeah. Uh, yeah it I, seems to me 2009 Dodge is a double whammy. We're being asked for asphalt roof, which seems reasonable since it's already replacing an asphalt roof. Um, but uh, they're changing the siding and uh, they want to go to a hardy board, uh, which I think, uh, you know, painted or, or pre-finished looks very much like uh, and is indistinguishable at any distance from wood siding. But for me, the issue with airset siding is always the, the trim pieces. And while hardy makes a nice corner board, my question would be, what about the existing trims and window surrounds? Uh, are, if those are being replaced, uh, I think would have a big problem with the Hardy board. Uh, if they're being uh, maintained, uh, then I don't have a problem. And that's just a general discussion that, you know, that in a position I'm going to take every time we see something where we're talking about uh, siding replacement. All right. Well, the applicant isn't here tonight to, to hear or to, to do that. I mean, as the um... Application comes up for pre-screening and again, you know, hopefully next month, um, the pre-screeners can make sure that the, um, it, that may be questions you even ask, but can make sure that those details are clear um, when we come back. And those details have been communicated to them, Commissioner Cohen. So I Thank believe you. once we get that information back, I think we will be able to review the package with the applicant present. Great. Okay, would somebody like to move to, Susie, do you want to move to continue? Sure, I move to continue uh, 2009 Dodge Avenue to the January 12th meeting. A second? Second. Second, yeah. Um, if I finally say all in favor. Um, roll call vote, Commissioner Idle. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye. Um, the next matter is 2027 Orrington Avenue. Huh. Is the applicant here to speak to this one? You know, I'm wondering if um, people communicated to Carlos who didn't get there communications. Do you want to continue it to January? Yeah. 
he, he did send emails to all of them. I, I don't know that they all responded, but they did all receive an email before before he left. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I mean, we don't usually have people like this who just don't show it. I, I'm wondering if they send emails back to him. And um, we just don't know. It doesn't matter. Let's continue. 2027 mm -hmm. Warrington. All right, I, I move to continue 2027 Orienton Avenue to the January 12th meeting. Uh, second. 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 Um, well, I'll call about Commissioner Idol. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. And then an aye. Um, all right, at the end, let's, we've got two more matters to continue, but let's go on to the last hearing was 2235 Sherman Avenue. Hi, I'm Brenda Wallace. I'm representing 2235 Sherman. Okay. Do you want to present your application, please? The home had a whole house fire in March of 2020. Um, the owner at the time of the fire um, decided not to um, bring the house back. Um, there was just some emotional ties. There was a family member home at the time of the fire. So we purchased it post fire. So our goal um, is to maintain the original beauty, especially from the exterior. Um, but also to bring it up to today's standards of usefulness. Um, to that, we are um, proposing a garage on the property. It's a two-car garage where there has not been one previously. Um, and changing the, um, the back entrance to an enclosed back entrance. Right now it's an open porch kind of um, entranceway that goes right into the kitchen. This would allow us to have a little mudroom before entering the kitchen. The windows um, have multiple layers of damage, all of them. Um, a part of it is age um, in the original windows. Part of it is um, the fire damage, the heat from the fire. Then the fire you know, department comes in and everything is wet. Um, there's been no utilities in the house since the time of the fire. So since March, there's been no heat, no air conditioning. So we also have those elements. Um, so we're proposing to keep the same um, size windows, leave all the, those openings as they are. There are eight windows currently that have um, divided lights. We are able to, with the Marvin windows, um, replicate those windows visually, simulated divided lights, and all eight of those windows would be um, replaced with those, the, the munions that are inside and outside. The very front of the house has um, an artistic leaded glass window that was very much so damaged and melted in the fire as lead will with heat. Um, we have spoken with uh, two different companies that assure us that they could bring that back. And so we'll do, we'll, that will remain and um, we'll be able to uh, fix that window. The front door would be the same door. They're able to um, fix that. If you look, um, I'm trying to see. Okay, you're on the, the site plan. Um, there are some some photos of the house and the, the damage. We've talked to a um, contractor, a carpenter, who says that that real thin wooden siding that we have, it's about three inches wide, is easily accessible. We can fix the damage that we have um, and use that same material on the garage so that the garage materials would directly visually replicate the house. Could you show us on each elevation what you're doing? I'm sorry, the, the pick the, you, you can direct the, presenter of which? Um, um, this, this is a rendering um, of the proposed uh, garage. Um, the lighting is going to um, 
mimic the the lighting in the, in the front house. There's one brass lantern um, that we believe there's no electricity to the house. We're not sure exactly of the working condition of it, but we believe we could fix that and find coordinating materials for the garage as well. Um, we know that we can uh, computer color match the the white of the house and the blue. Um, we do. You'll see in you'll see in front of the garage where it's um, Unilock brick timber. The original driveway stops about midway um, through the house. That is concrete, and because there wasn't a garage, it just stops. Um, the brick paver will continue on from from where the concrete is to the garage. So the the other aspects of your project are the um, replacement of the. Of different windows, including the specially diamond shaped buttons, restore mm -hmm. the glass windows, and addition mm -hmm. of a closed entrance to the rear. Could you okay. share that? This is a rendering of what the new back enclosed entrance, um, what we're proposing to do with that. Knowing that, again, when you, when you it's not visually from either, uh, you can't see it from the front of the house, you can't see it from either side, it's directly the back entrance. Um, it just allows us to have a little mudroom area and closed area before coming right into the kitchen. Okay, and then the, could you show us the windows that are being replaced and what's replacing them? And the windows you... that are replacing them, is um, Ian able to come on? Um, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Parker, can you go to the addendum too for this? That might help them. Kay, do you have that? That um, I, I do. That's what I'm asking thank her. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what Marvin's able to do is they're able to visually replicate the, the diamond shaped um, original windows with a, a simulated uh, divided light. The goal with the restoration is that if you walked past this house because you lived in the neighborhood 20 years ago, that if you walked past it now, you wouldn't notice that we had done anything. And um, the pitch of the, the roof for the new garage mimics the, the pitch for the house. So you might walk past it and say, hey, was there a garage there before or not? And hopefully not even know for sure. For those new uh, windows with the diamonds from Marvin, then are the muntins in between the glass or are they applied on the outside? Oh, so the, the Marvin windows we're using is the Marvin uh, Ultimate Generation 2 window. It's a wood interior, aluminum clad exterior, and the muntins would be permanently applied inside and outside of the glass to replicate the true divided light look that I assume existed there uh, before. So no, we don't use any in between the glass grid options there. Okay, thank you. Wait, I just have a quick question. The The agenda says that you're replacing the wood windows with new wood windows, but you had just mentioned aluminum clad windows. Can you clarify on that? They're wood interior, clad exterior. So to this, the description on the agenda is not correct, correct? The Because it specifically says new wood windows, not new aluminum clad wood windows. Correct. I apologize. Oh no, that's fine. I just want to. I just want to make sure I understand the scope. I think um, the intention was to differentiate between a vinyl uh, window and and not being specifically. Um, it's not my area of expertise. Just just to make sure that you knew that we weren't doing vinyl windows or you know something else. Uh, I have a question. Uh, for, first of all, I think that. The Marvin clad window uh, is a good product. The SDL that you're that you're showing with the diamond lights is a is a really great window. Um, if you're since you're going to a clad 
wood clad window for all the exteriors, which uh, means no maintenance. Are you changing all of the windows? Will everything be uh, uh, an aluminum clad exterior? Our proposal is to, is to change out all the windows. Okay. We have um, no functioning windows. Um, and this will be able to, you know, to bring it up to today's standards of efficiency, insulation, um, but still keeping that same, same look as much as we can. Yes, I mean, what I would say is, is Marvin is one of the most historically accurate windows that you can get. Um, I've worked on projects in Evanston historical districts before, and it's, it's one of the windows that can really match up with uh, the older style windows. And that's 100% our goal. And, and they were the ones who, would, who worked with us in replicating um, the eight specialty windows. All right, other questions from commissioners? Yeah, uh, and we're looking at the new rear edition right now, right? At the lower right? Correct, and the lower right is, is, is the new rear, rear edition. The same um, wood siding that you see on the front of the house and that we're gonna use on the garage would be on there as well. And there's just a little bit of detail um, on the very top that is shown on um, the sides of the house at, at inside the um, peaks um, that we will replicate on that and then also on the garage. Just so it has the same texture. We don't want anything to be real flat. We want to keep the same dimension, the same characteristics as much as possible. All right. Was there any member of the public here to comment on this matter? Uh, yes. Uh, can you introduce yourself, please. Sure, uh, my name is Dan Abraham. Um, I live at uh, 725 Noy Street. Yes, sir. Um, so um, I am here to um, object to um, an issuance of the uh, certificate of appropriateness uh, in this case. Um, and primarily I wanna focus on the proposed two car garage um, that's part of this application um, the construction of a new two car garage uh, in this location uh, where none has existed before uh, is certainly sure. in keeping with the goals of the Evanston Preservation Commission. Uh, the construction of a new two car garage is contrary to the goal of preserving uh, the Northeast Historic District. Uh, in support of this position, um, I would refer to um, you know, the Illinois uh, Code of Ordinances Title II that, that the commission um, uh, works from. Um, and it doesn't seem to be in compliance uh, with the requirements of the portion of the code um, for this type of application. Um, specifically, um, with respect to the height of the garage, um, you know, the height of the proposed garage, not visually compatible with um, property structures um, in, um, to which it's visually related. Um, I would also say the, the rhythm and spacing of the structure um, is not um, is not appropriate uh, for this area. Um, the scale of the structure, uh, meaning the size and the mass of the garage is not visually compatible. Um, the proposed garage would create an overcrowded yard inconsistent with the historic spacing of surrounding structures. Um, uh, in addition to um, that, um, I think, you know, if you look at um, the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties, um, I think um, similar considerations um, with respect to the impact of this project on, um, on the current um, garden, vegetation, and yards uh, in this area um, would be significantly negatively affected. Um, the size and scale of the proposed garage is not compatible with the principal residence um, or the small backyard uh, within which it would be located. Um, you know, those standards further require um, that new construction should be appropriately scaled and located um, far enough away um, to preserve the historic nature of the setting. Um, and the proposed garage is far too close to neighboring homes. Um, I should say specifically my home. Uh, we have abutting uh, rear yards. Um, it's not, um, I think the pictures that have been 
presented as part of this project are a little bit misleading. Um, there's not a forest behind the garage that's being proposed here. My house is behind the garage. There's no um, trees there uh, in between. Um, in fact, there's a very nice, well, I should say there are some very nice smaller trees, not the large trees that are depicted in the, in the pictures. Uh, and clearly, you know, that vegetation would be um, destroyed, removed uh, as part of this project. Um, so I think that it's, it's clear um, uh, to me that when you look at, you know, the recommended and not recommended um, aspects of these types of new construction projects, um, that the, um, uh, the nature of this project is inconsistent. Um, I would just um, note that um, uh, the, we've recently become aware, and of course, we've only been aware of this um, meeting, you know, for the last couple of days, but we've recently become aware that the curb cut and driveway um, to the side of the property um, was a, a much more recent addition. Um, uh, that was brought to our attention um, by the alderman. Um, we're in the process of investigating uh, all of the conditions that uh, were put in place surrounding the creation of that, of that curb cut and driveway, um, but certainly um, the driveway um, was not a part of the, um, of the yard um, that went along with this historic, in this historic district at this location. And certainly um, there's never been a garage at this location um, and it's um, inconsistent with, um, with um, the rules of the commission. Uh, and we would ask that, it, that this application not be approved. Um, could we see the, um, could the presenters uh, take us to the site plan? I don't know which slide it is. And Chair Simon, I have a, a follow-up question when they get there. Uh, there is a garage that is similarly located in the back of the property, two homes, I believe, to the north. Can you maybe comment on how the garage structure that you're proposing relates to that garage structure, which is at a similar placement? And um, I believe they access that off of Sherman as opposed to the alley that's on the backside. Mm -hmm. We don't have an alley. Um, the placement of the of the garage was to use as little of the property as possible, but again, to set it back from the home. Um, we kept height and size um, very much into consideration, as well as the other homes around us. I will, I will agree with the neighbor who says there isn't a forest behind us. Um, that is an artistic rendering. Um, based on photographs um, that we were asked for uh, a couple weeks ago. And so I had, we got that done um, as quickly as possible, basically to show the proportion of where the house is, which you can see from the site plan as well, to where the garage is. Um, but I think that would be the natural location for the garage. I mean, you know, not moving it behind the property itself to keep you know, in the plane of the existing driveway. Um, again, height and size is not overbearing to the house or the structure of the property. Um, we worked really hard with zoning, you know, with impervious, impervious surfaces and, you know, making sure all, all of those things um, correlated. And I think we also have to go back to, um, you know, which is in the application, is about making it the house to today's standards of usefulness. And I think it's appropriate for a house used today to have a garage. I don't, I, I don't think that that's an inappropriate um, ask. Is there, I'm sorry, is there a garage? I, I was expecting to see maybe the existing survey. Is there a garage there now? There is, there's, there, to my knowledge, there has not been a, a, a garage on this property before. Great. And just if I could answer the commissioner's question, um, the house two doors north uh, no longer has a garage in that location. Thank you. And I can speak really quickly to um, the the driveway was was permitted under the the previous owner who had a medical issue. I don't I don't know the specific conditions related to installation. That is, he's correct. That's something that we're researching. But I believe that's something that would come up during permitting, not necessarily during your review. 
of the COA. Okay. So even if the COA were issued, if there were issues with, with that, it would come up during permitting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just informationally, we have pretty much always approved. I mean, just as a matter of we have to treat projects similarly, we've approved a very large number of two and three car garages. And to be honest, we've never turned one down because of the, really the factors the applicant cites is that it, you know, just it's functional. People need it for, for utility reasons. And um, I, I think we, you know, again, we probably, I, I mean, in the four years I've been in the commission, we probably approved 75, two or three car garages and never disapproved one. I, I think it's a matter of, we're obligated to act consistently. We have a really hard time turning down something we've approved in every single case. Yeah. I think just one last point I'd like to just make, I'm sorry, before I wrap up, which is that what you can't tell from this um, site drawing is that um, the, the yard, there, this backyard does not abut another backyard um, or an alley, um, but it uh, butts directly onto, you know, a small pathway that then leads to, to my house. So because of the orientation of the house in the corner, um, there's no yard or garage at that location. In fact, my house does not have a garage. Um, so I just wanted to make sure it was clear that it, exactly at, um, on the other side of the property line, um, you know, set back appropriately um, is not another yard. How far is your garage, is your house from the existing garage? Isn't it, a, don't you have a yard there? No, there, there's no yard there because our house is on, our front is on Noise Street. And okay. so, um, so our so yard, we, yeah, so we do have a abutting your side. It's abutting your side yard is what you're saying. There was no yard there. It's just uh, the appropriate three foot setback path. So you're telling us that the back of this garage is three feet, will be uh, six feet from, I'm sorry, I can't tell how far it's, off the property line, but it'll be approximately six feet from the side of your house. Uh, more or less. I think they might have put in a little bit more than three feet between the property line and the garage. It's a little hard to read at this scale. The dashed line is the, the minimum zoning setback. Is that what that shows? Uh, five feet. It's five feet. Five feet, and what is it at the back? Uh, uh, it's five, five foot five. Yeah, so it's a little further than the, the minimum of the zoning. Yeah. It, it, I kind of agree with Chair Simon. I, I don't see, I don't see another different logical place to put a garage that would be any, any more compliant with the standards. Um, it's kind of the natural location uh, to put it kind of towards the back of the lot and uh, away from away from the house there's a minimum distance between the house and the garage they have to they have to follow and so I don't think they really have a lot of any other any other options other than this location to put a garage um, and I guess looking back at the the overall plan for the main house I think they're I think they're doing a good job I think they're meeting the standards and uh, um, I'm glad to see them going to this effort to repair a fire damaged house instead of having it turn into a teardown. Yeah, I would agree with Ken. I think uh, you should be complimented on the quality of the work you're proposing to do and the quality of the design. Thank you for showing us the floor plans. They're not a requirement, but they make the uh, little uh, vestibule uh, mudroom addition to the back of the house uh, completely understandable, uh, and I compliment you not only on the design, design of that element, but the fact that you're using a very high quality window, which will, uh, uh, in terms of its appearance, duplicate what you're replacing uh, mm -hmm. with respect to the garage. Um, from a zoning point of view, I see no reason why it shouldn't be there. And from a compatibility point of view, uh, with respect to our standards, uh, I have no objections to it. I've read the Secretary of the Interior standards, uh, as well as all of our standards and the uh, uh, objector, and I'm not sure what the objector is referring to, 
uh, although I do sympathize with the fact that this, because of the zoning and the fact that his house faces um, uh, uh, in a different direction, that there will mm -hmm. be uh, not a lot of space between the back of the garage and his house. All right. Any other commissioners um, wish to? I had a question just about the um, the work before the leaded glass windows. Um, are you replacing them with new glass windows, or are you working there, with the original material? There are two artistic leaded glass windows that are made out of individual pieces of beveled glass. Mm -hmm. One, we got lucky. <laughs> Uh, it only needs probably a, a, um, a professional cleaning. It was not damaged in the fire. Okay. That's the one off to the side of, of the driveway in the back. The one in the very front of the house is the one that is melted, pieces of glass broke. Um, okay. I have been told um, by Tim Murphy with TMC oh. Windows, um, who um, hopefully is a recognizable name to you. We, we um, that he can reuse the materials that are there and then just incorporate new materials to totally restore that window. Mm -hmm. So what we can salvage the pieces of glass, um, there are pictures of, of, there is a picture of this if you go down to the, the photos last, of the existing home. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he, can, he can fix that with all the materials, just bringing in the pieces, individual pieces of glass that are needed. Yeah. And then somehow, however he does it, maybe he probably uses another heat source <laughs> to straighten it out again. But he has assured me that he can um, restore that window and the front door as well. So those those elements will not be painted at all. Those will be restored. That sounds good. Okay. My my compliments to you again. Uh, I know Tim Murphy's work, and he is uh, <laughs> a reliable craftsman. He's very good. I will tell you that we tried really hard. Um, with the resources, you know, getting online, talking to people, talking to people who, who knew people who said, one, do you, do you know how to work with a historical home, you know, and, and the care that is needed with that and also do the work and, how, you know, what is your knowledge base? And so we, we have tried to bring in the best people that we could for this. Okay, thank you. Why don't we, um, would somebody like to make a motion to vote? Uh, it's getting late. Stuart, do you want to make a motion? Oh, um, may, may. I'm, I'm, I'm a neighbor to the, to, to the north. Uh, do I have an opportunity to speak? Sure, just uh, state your name for the record, please. Yeah, my name is Peter Evans. I live at uh, 2237 Sherman. So I am adjacent to, uh, to 2235 to the north. Um, and yes, the, uh, the garage that uh, one of the commissioners was referring to, uh, to the house immediately to the north of me uh, was torn down. Um, and I believe that they did so because they believe that it was out of conformance with, uh, with the character of the neighborhood and they wanted to open up the backyards. My biggest concern, uh, well, two concerns. I'm, I'm very concerned about, uh, uh, you know, Dan's house being uh, blocked uh, by, uh, you know, by a garage. Um, he's obviously going to lose a lot of light. Um, and I don't think that, you know, that, that a garage of that size on a lot uh, of that. So it's a very small backyard. I mean, it's a very, very small backyard that they're jamming that thing into. Um, when the neighbor built uh, uh, the house on the, uh, the garage on the alley, uh, my backyard now floods, um, which, you know, it is what it is. Um, so I'm concerned not just about the character of, you know, the, the, the uh, backyards changing, but of water runoff. And so I don't, I know that may be outside of the purview of, of your committee, but I am very concerned about excess water. All of these houses flood, um, you know, everybody's put in drain tiles and, and we do what we possibly can, but, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, that much water being displaced, I would hope that there's some, some thought and care put into that as well. Yeah. To the I best will. of my understanding, uh, uh, this has to meet the requirements for impervious surface, but uh, Evanston also requires, I think, for a project like this, the submission of civil engineering drawings uh, so that they can assure uh, that running water off onto adjacent properties, which is illegal to do, 
uh, will not be the case here. And I would uh, uh, tell you to uh, follow up on that with respect to this project. Um, I understand the, the desire to build a garage. I agree with you that uh, the backyard sort of goes away when you do so, but I don't think it's within our uh, within the within the commission's purview to tell anybody that they can't build a garage as long as it uh, is compatible with the existing structure, meets our standards, and uh, is uh, uh, acceptable under the zoning. Yeah. And to assure the neighbor, we have um, contracted Green Guard, uh, which is an engineering and surveying company, yeah. and they have an extensive uh, topography on the property. Um, we worked with Michael Griffith in regards to the, the uh, pervious versus impervious surface um, of the entire property. Um, and there, there were numerous changes made to our proposal based on our conversations with him. And we actually went through that process before coming to this committee to make sure that we, um, that everything was correct there first and that everything passed and was approved there. Um, if you do want to talk to somebody at the city, I'm sure like, you know, you could email Cade and um, get a referral um, for her to talk to her about that. Peter, it'll, it'll come up during the permitting process. It's, it's reviewed by the city engineer um, and they would ensure that all the, the water remains on site. It has to stay on site in, it can't drain into the roadway either. So it can't go into the public way. It can't go into neighboring properties and the city engineer. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Um, would somebody like to make a motion to approve? Um, sure. I'll make, a, I, I make a motion that we approve uh, additions, alterations, and the construction of a new uh, two car garage for the property at uh, 2235 Sherman Avenue, um, uh, Landmark Northeast uh, District Case uh, 20 uh, Press uh, 0319. I think the only thing is you have to state the, um, the do state. I do, is that I, the oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm new to all of this. Uh, what do I Tell me what I need to say. The center is up for alteration one through 10, et cetera. Oh, uh, yeah, it meets the applicable standards one through 10 uh, and construction one through four, seven, eight, and 10. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the demolition requirements are, but demolition one through six. Okay, a second. I'll second. second. Okay. Um, roll call vote, Commissioner Idle. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to continue the other two? Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you reminded me. So um, let's, it says you want to move to continue 1509 Forest. Sure. So I move to continue 1509 Forest Avenue to the January 12th meeting. Uh, second. Second. Okay, uh, roll call vote, Commissioner Idol. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Rein Reinhold. Aye. And Commissioner Simon is yes. Um, the other matter was the church at 1208 Ashland. Um, I don't know if you, just before we move on from it, um, the, um, I, I, the application, maybe this is why it's not here, maybe you gave this feedback. The application has like, really doesn't depict, um, you know, what's there now or what it's gonna be replaced with. It's like one page. I, I don't know if you already, maybe, when it, it, maybe you already did this, but when it comes back, um, I assume you'll maybe try to get more information so just from the pre-review standpoint julie and i conveyed to scott and carlos that not only did we we needed a purpose for the proposed work we needed some information on the disrepair of the existing windows 
photos of the condition of the existing windows and what they looked like from the inside and the outside. And then a little bit more information about what is actually being replaced and or if they're just getting re -letted. We also asked them to have their contractor available to discuss and answer any questions if that was possible. What, one additional question is, I can't tell if there's already protective glazing on these, if, if, if we could find that out. I just can't tell. All right. Well, maybe the rear what window. kind of glazing? Pro, uh, protective glazing, uh, oh, protective. Uh, an additional um, window of glass, hopefully plain glass that's vented or not. You know, just a single panel of glass that would be oh. on the exterior side. Uh, I mean, we can work with Carlos when we do the next pre-review to follow up on these ones that were continued. Yeah, I mean, maybe they didn't attend tonight because they knew they hadn't done any of these things. Um, all right, so um, Beth, do you want to move for 1208 Ashland to be continued? I think you just have to, you don't have to yeah, say sure. Uh, I move that 1208 Ashland Avenue, case 20, Prez 0314, be continued until the, the January 2021 meeting. A second. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, Commissioner Idol. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thanks. So it is um, great. It's only um, commissioners and staff on the meeting for the participants. Um, Kay, do you wanna take the rest of the program? Sure, yeah. Um, approval of the meeting minutes. I know I've received a few comments already, which I've incorporated. Um, if someone wants to make a motion to approve, we can we can do that. Or if you have more comments, um. I'll uh, if nobody's going to jump in, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of November tenth, twenty twenty, with uh, including the various comments that people emailed to staff. Second. Okay. Um. A vote, Commissioner Idol. Aye. Stuart, I don't think you can vote, you weren't here. Um, Commissioner Morris. Um, abstaining, wasn't present. Uh, okay, Commissioner Bowden. Aye. Commissioner Reinhold. Aye. And I'm an aye. So. Okay, and then the next item is election of, of officers and I believe that some were nominated, correct, Chair? Yes. Um, the, the nominees, I think, were um, Beth for Secretary, Susie for Vice Chairman, and myself for Chair. OK. Um, um, yeah, typically we would just we would vote on each one. We would ask them to accept the nomination and then and then take a vote on each one. <laughs> okay, just to clarify, I don't take the notes, right? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> okay. Purely on a name I, was, only. I want this in the minutes. <laughs> this is like one of those ancient English Sinishers, where you all you do is get paid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. mm. but I think we all accept in this. Um, yeah, sure. I accept. Sure. <laughs> um, we can leave it up to you. We can go through each one and actually formally vote, or I think it's okay to do a roll call vote for a discussion. I mean, not a roll call, but just a one uh, a, a, a motion to approve the the slate of candidates as a whole yes, correct mm -hmm. i think you have to make that motion ken since you're <laughs> uh, passing the uh, torch getting ready to rotate off in a six months or so uh sure i'll uh i'll make a motion to uh appoint the officers for 2021 uh, as as previously mentioned uh second second 
Okay, then I guess we're to a roll call vote. Commissioner Idle? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Morris? Aye, and thank you. Commissioner Bardin? Aye. Commissioner Reinhold? Aye. And aye. Don't worry, Jamie, I tried to get you roped in, but it didn't take. <laughs> I'll play the kid card. <laughs> All right, it's about 10 o'clock. Um, hard meeting with some hard matters. Um, does anybody else have anything they uh, we need to discuss? Kate, um, thanks for doing a great job. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. It's nice to, to fill in. It's hard to know how much to jump in here and there, but. <laughs> yeah, no, we, it was very helpful. You did a great job. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stuart, I'm sorry that I'm putting you in this position, but I assume Julie will continue to do the pre-review this next month. Um, yeah, I haven't discussed it with her, but I think she it, that's her intention. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Um, I don't think everybody in favor of adjourning, yes? Yes. All right, thank you. See you next month. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Good night.